called to order at this time, 7.03 p.m. The date is February 12, 2008. The board consists of five members and two alternates. I think we still have two alternates. Mm -hmm. um, an alternate takes pu a full part in discussions of the board and becomes a voting member in the absence or conflict of interest of a regular member. And present this evening are members um, Greg Lavelle, John Golzi, Betty Hollow, myself, Muriel Frederick, and our newly reappointed, Hector Flores. Welcome back. <laughs> um, also present this evening are Zoning Administrator Steve Pearson and um, Paul Eschenbacher, our Acting Secretary. And I guess this evening we don't have anybody present from the Law Director's Office, right? I received an email late this afternoon that Mr. Lang would not be able to attend. Okay. Just making sure there wasn't some new face that I didn't recognize. So, um, the board operates according to the following procedure. The chair uh, names and describes the case. The zoning administrator will cite the specifics of the refusal of the case. The appellant or representative then will state the case for granting the appeal. Testimony next will be taken from those who, grant, uh, who support granting the appeal. Next, those who wish to speak in general comment and those who support, support denial of the appeal. Following all testimonies, the board will receive concluding remarks from the appellant. Discussion from the floor then will be closed. The board will deliberate and render a decision. Um, under Athens City Code Section 230703B, the board has the power to grant such variances from the code as will not be contrary to the public interest so that the spirit of the code shall be observed, public safety and welfare are secured, and substantial justice done. Um, Athens City Code Section 23. 0910C or 0703. I, I think I may have a mis, uh, misprint on either one or the other of those two, but requires that variances from the code shall not be granted unless the board, board makes specific findings of fact based directly on uh, evidence provided to it that each and every one of the following six criteria are met. And, um, well, I'll read them and then I'll explain from a practical difficulty or undue hardship. There must exist a practical difficulty or undue hardship caused by exceptional conditions pertaining to the specific piece of property. Exceptional circumstances must exist exceptional circumstances or conditions applying to the property or its intended use that do not in general apply to properties in the same zoning district. Then preservation of equal property rights, it must be determined that literal interpretation of the code would deprive the appellant of rights commonly enjoyed by others in the same vicinity while granting the variance would not convey special privilege. Minimum variance, it must be de determined the variance is the minimum required to make a reasonable use of the property. Absence of detriment, it must be determined the granting of the variance will not be of substantial detriment to adjacent properties nor materially impair the purposes of the code or the public interest. And then last, if not of a general nature, the variance sought must not be of a general or recurring nature such that the uh, situation would more reasonably be handled by changing the law. Um, when, the, when we are doing a variance, it's custom uh, of the board to present the variance request as a motion to grant the appeal. I just wanted to remark here that um, grant, moving to grant doesn't commit to anything. It just uh, offers it for consideration. Um, any person who's aggrieved by the decision of the board may file an appeal to the Court of Common Pleas. Such petition must be filed within 30 days after the mailing of the board's resolution to the appellant. Tonight, there were to have been three cases on the agenda, number 0715V for 38 North Court Street, which is zoned B2D, the Wasserman Group LLC were the appellants. Um, I believe this one has been continued till next month because there would not be um, one, two, three, or there are now five. It was originally, there, there was originally, uh, it was expected that there would not be um, five to hear it. Ha and Steve, uh, my understanding was that the request for a continuous was made and it has been continued to next month? That's correct. Mr. Lavelle, um, in two previous hearings of this case, has accused himself. Oh, I see. It's Mr. Lavelle who's, yeah, okay, got it. So we still only have four. And We've only had four. Yeah. For okay. First case. So that one has been um, it moved to next month. The um, we do have um, number 0802V for Seven Garfield Avenue, which is zoned R1. Gary Kerber is the appellant. 
that one we are hearing this evening, and the one that the other one that has been um, continued to next month is 0803 for 11 and 13 West Stimson Avenue, which is in B3 zoning, um, and the had requested a continuance because of a death in the family on the part of um, the attorney. Or death in the family, or anyway, there was a bereavement that was involving him, and he couldn't be here. So, this evening we are hearing only the one case. Um, the board is required by law to take testimony under oath. Anyone wishing to speak this evening, please stand to be sworn. Um, do you swear that the testimony you will give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. Well then, Steve, could you tell us the reasons for the refusal on um, this is a, the appellant is requesting a variance from 230401B2 to permit an accessory use parking facility on a lot where no principal use exists. That's correct. My name is Steve Pearson. I'm the zoning administrator for the uh, city of Athens, and I have been sworn in. Um, the packet of information that I provided you is just uh, the first sheet's just a copy of the refusal um, that cites a particular section mm -hmm. of code on which the refusal was based. Um, I then provided you with the page that talks about permitted accessory uses and parking facilities for the exclusive use of the residents of the premises are permitted. In this particular case, there's no principal dwelling structure on this lot, so the, the premise for this parking use will be on an adjacent lot. Um, give you the definition then of an accessory use. An accessory use is one that's subordinate to a principal use. In other words, it assumes there's a principal use on the lot. Accessory uses aren't permitted without first establishing a principal use. And there should be a copy of a tax plat, kind of like a vicinity map. Um, 52 Columbia, you can see Columbia Avenue. That's in the upper part. Some of the drawing, the lot in question, 7 Garfield, is just below it, and there's a five-foot alley in between. And 7 Garfield is a standalone vacant lot at the moment with no so structure. So the alley would make it impossible to um, combine those two lots into a single lot of record. Is That's that correct. If that portion of the alley were vacated, then it could be combined to a single lot of record, and there'd be no necessity for this hearing. Okay, but it but cannot the be. alley does still exist. Okay. Um, then there are some drawings that Mr. Kerber provided, another smaller one. Or actually, it's a little more close up. Of, uh, it shows a house at um, 9 Garfield, the proposed parking at 7 Garfield, and then the residence where the use, um, the accessory use will apply to at 52 Columbia. Um, and then there's just another another drawing showing the size of the parking spaces that do comply with the. Uh, with size requirement, which is a minimum nine foot width and a minimum area of 180 square feet. Um, it, uh, the drawing sh says abandoned alley, but it's not an abandoned alley. It's it's a unmaintained alley. Okay, it's an unmaintained alley. Yeah, but it's it's not platted, um, but not maintained. There are, I believe, sewer lines that run down through it, not water lines, but there are sewer lines. It is somewhat passable, but it's not graded and maintained. It has grass growing on it. There's no gravel. So it's a platted but unmaintained public alley. And then Mr. Kerber provided um, what I believe were to be the answers to the uh, questions required of the narrative statement that the yeah, appellant is supposed to provide. Yeah, we some clarification on those. And then just today I received um, two letters. Um, and I gave you copies of those. One's an email that I received this morning. The other was a hand-delivered letter. So these were not uh, available to be seen before today, so they should probably be read into the record? Or um, well, I just noted that they, they are part of the record. There. You could, okay. you could, come you could read okay. them if you that'll like, be, but they're, they are part of the record. Mr. Eschenbacher talked to Jill Neustadt. Was that her name? Neustadt? She came in this morning, dropped this letter off, and I received the email um, this morning. You can see there that I responded that I would forward it to the board at 9.50 a.m. this morning. So these both just came in. Okay. 
And Steve, yes. that drawing that you have, it shows four parking spaces. Is that the existing or the proposed? That's proposed. So those are like four stacked? Two of them are stacked? Uh, this is an R1 single family residential zone where um, access to all parking spaces is not a requirement. Okay. So if the, it were attached to a house. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. And how many people live in the house? Um, I believe Mr. Kerber is um, the sole owner and resident of the property. Is there anybody else on the property? Uh, yeah, Mr. Kerber is here tonight and he could probably answer those questions for you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other uh, questions for Steve? Thanks. All right, you're welcome. Okay. Well then, um, Mr. Kerber, if you would like to present your case for us. Um, would you uh, affirm that you have been previously sworn and state your name and address for the record, please? Uh, my name is Gary Kerber, and uh, I have previously sworn. And your address is? Uh, 52 Columbia. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, Mr. Kerber, your narrative statement, would you like to begin by elaborating on that a little bit? Um, well, I'm trying to uh, put parking on the property below my uh, property at uh, <coughs> 7 Garfield and um, for use for parking for my property at 52 Columbia. Mm -hmm. That's about it. Um, and this property, you, you own this property? Yes, I do. I and I do have a... Um, lease to own purchase agreement with the uh, owner of Seven Garfield. Oh, I see. The owner it currently is not you, it's, it's, but you have a, you, yeah. okay. Yeah. And, you've, and got, you, you've got an option on it. Yeah, and I have a letter here saying okay. that he's... Do you have any parking at 52 Columbia at the moment? Um, <clears throat> just street parking. Uh, yeah, just street parking. Street parking, so there's no no parking on site at 52. No. And how many people live in a house with you? Myself. And why four parking spaces? Uh, I'm trying to comply with um, with the code. Um, well, you grandfathered apparently to park on the street and not to have to have any. So. We need to understand why you would need this extra parking. Um, <clears throat> well, I'd like to have a renter, and uh, you know, apparently I'm told that, that you need three parking spaces minimal. But if you had three renters, you would have to have three parking spaces. Yeah. yeah so so that's, that's what I'm trying to do. Do you have a renter now? No, I don't. Would you have three renters? No, just maybe one, maybe. Just one more. And would they simply rent rooms in the house, or what would be the arrangement? Yeah. Yes. Yes, they would rent rooms in the house. And and use your kitchen? Uh, yeah. Was there any other rental space that's available in your property? Uh, no. Okay. So you have a four a four bedroom house then I gather, uh, or is it a five bedroom, three house? bedroom house? Three bedroom house. So that would be one parking space per bedroom. <clears throat> yeah. And that would be three parking spaces. Yeah. So why four on your plat? Um, uh, three would be fine if, if you want to improve three. And is that property, if I remember right, that property is pretty much grass. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's on a. You mean Seven Garfield? Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty much grass. There's nothing else on it. It's a fairly. It's a, a lot of it's fairly severely sloped, isn't it? Uh, not severely sloped. But it. Yeah. But it, it wouldn't. It wouldn't need any kind of retaining walls or um, anything to hold back the soil. Mm -hmm. The parking can be put on it with limited. Um, Grading. What kind of, first off, explain limited grading, and second off, what kind of surface would you put? Just gravel. 
And would that interfere with the flow of water from your neighbor's property? No. And um, I may be presumptuous, but do you have any intentions of renting out your house? Uh, not at this time. I mean, you moving and, and renting it? Not at this time. Well, um, this may be a presumptuous question, but we do have a letter uh, from somebody who lives in your neighborhood in Columbia um, who says that uh, she has heard that you're planning to, um, to create a duplex. Now, that may simply be neighborhood rumor, but could you yeah, address that? I have that? no idea. I've never told anybody that I was going to create a duplex there. Mm -hmm. So where they come up with this, okay. it's beyond me. Okay. Well, I'm still not getting a very clear picture of what it is you want to do. You have a three-bedroom house. You're proposing to have three renters. Are your bedrooms big enough no, to have two? three renters, just myself and two other people. Okay. So then you only need two parking space now. Well, and perhaps three. one for well, himself. He'd need one for himself and one for the other two people if he was <clears throat> renting to two other people. You actually need four, just for clarification. Because of the two that he already needs plus the two? Um, Table B, off street parking requirement says that an owner occupied single family dwelling has to have two for each dwelling unit. Okay. Um, Plus. Ir irregardless of the number of family residents. And then one for each additional okay, renter. Okay, so he needs four spaces. He needs four for two. Okay. But isn't he grandfathered? He's grandfathered for those that original two. Um, I mean, for the two that's supposed to be. Now, anytime you propose a change in use, you, you forfeit he, the right. grandfather. So he's forfeiting the grandfather clause. Yeah. Okay. So okay. then he would need four. Correct. Okay. And that would be two personal and two possible renters. That's correct. And Is the there maximum a number of renters that you're permitted as a uh, as a homeowner is keeping of not more than two renters by a resident owner. So a family can, used to be a family could have three rumors. The code was changed in 2005 mm -hmm. um, to reduce that down to two. Right. Okay. Um, okay. But because if you what, wants, yeah. you know, what happened was with, a, say, a family used to be able to um, keep three rumors, mm -hmm. um, but a single person, a single property owner um, who was not married could only keep two because they were one of the three unrelated. So the definition of family changed in 2005, and the number of rumors you were allowed to keep was reduced from three to two. Mm -hmm. okay. And it essentially kept the, the number three more consistent throughout the, the code. Three unrelated persons, or a single person with two rumors, or a family with two rumors. Mm -hmm. And it afforded the same rights to a single person who owned a property as it did to a family that owned a property. Well, I have your, well, we got your attention. <coughs> Is there, a, if we say, uh, is there a way to stipulate that two spaces are for the owner of the house and two for renters? Is there a way we can stipulate something like that? Or once well, that's we what the code it, requires. But once we pass this, that's four spaces. He that's moves out. That's four spaces, out. and then when he moves out, he can rent to he four people. He can rent people. to four people. No, no. The maximum number of unrelated persons permitted in oh, our own zone is three. Three. So he could rent Irregardless of the number of parking Okay, spaces. so the most that he would have would be three. Right. Well, that also if someone decides to put a house on this uh, Simon Garfield in the future, so this four space has already been given a variance to be as a part of the 52 for the for 52 Columbia, right? So what happens then? Um, the board granting a variance can attach conditions to safeguard the uh, the variance, and okay. so you could attach um, a condition to the variance that if the property um, ever had any construction of a principal dwelling upon it, that the variance would be void. Okay. This variance That's one is possibility. this variance request is for seven. Um, seven Garfield. Garfield. Yeah, so the variance is for seven Garfield, so the findings need to be for seven well, Garfield. But it's used for 52. I think the thing that we need to think about is we're talking about supplying parking for a property. 
on a property that does not have a principal dwelling. Right. So in effect, you're creating a parking lot mm -hmm. in, in an R1 district. And I know that the code has changed over the years, but there certainly was a time not too long ago when parking lots in R1 districts were strictly prohibited. Mm -hmm. Now, the code has loosened up so that, that the code doesn't strictly say that anymore. But I guess the question is whether we think it's desirable to have, quote, a parking lot in an R1 district, which this would be, because it has no other mm -hmm. um, property on the lot. And the code does say that an accessory that, but... use should be accessory and not and should be, quote, subordinate to the principal use of a building or the principal use of land, which is located on the same lot. Now, if, <coughs> if the property was located to my left or to my right, then I wouldn't be needing a variance. But you mean you could purchase it and it and, would be and contiguous and in your ownership and, and you the could... The only thing that's, the, you know, this is the minimum variance possible in this situation. Well, it depends on how you interpret that. I, yeah. I, you know, it's not, it's not the minimum use to make a reasonable use of a seven gar field because it could be used for a different purpose than, a, than parking space for you. It could become a building lot, I assume, maybe not. Uh, and it's not necessarily the minimal variance for your own property, I mean, which other variances have been approved for outside the 250 foot limit. Yes, know. I understand that, but the they were uh, they were in a different district, not necessarily in an mm -hmm. R1 that were going to become only parking. They they would have had to be parking well, already. I'd like to see if there's any information on that. If there there has been other in an R1 district. Yeah. With, with Steve Pearson. He though. might know that. Um, I can think of one right now, right off the top of my head. Where's that? Um, actually, two. One on West Union Street. No, wait a minute. West, West Washington Street, coming mm -hmm. down the hill at the corner of. Mm -hmm. uh, well, since you're coming down off the hill behind the middle school. Okay. And then it's one of those streets that takes Pratt. There's one on Pratt. Um, I don't know where Pratt is. I mean, right off the top of my head, I can think of those two. What we have at the Code Enforcement Office also is a list. Paul Eschenbacher has completed a list of the address of all the properties and the type of variance that was granted. Um, and I think I reported um, to you a while back that since the parking requirements were changed, you've heard about 40 cases regarding parking. Sure. Um, and, you know, at the office, we could do a search and find out what zone each one of those was in. But I'm familiar with at least those two. Um, there have been some requests though, that have been refused also. Um, when I wait Grover, uh, two or three times, um, that's in an R1 zone. But that's just right off the top of my head. I mean, we have the complete list of the database available at the office. Is he Not yet. Okay, thank you. Um, According to it would be useful if we had that sort of information at our fingertips at the meetings, but as we haven't, it's really good to have you. Thank you. Um, are there additional questions, or is there additional that you want to say about your case? Well, could you clarify again? Are you intending to purchase this property or yes, lease I am. it? I, I'm entering into lease to purchase pro the property. And, uh, and, uh, to and lease the space or just to purchase the property? I am going to purchase the property. Okay. It's a lease okay. purchase agreement. Okay. And, and in the future date here, I'm going to purchase the property and, um, and then deed over the, pro the, the parking to 52 Columbia. Was there ever a time at, at, at your residence on Columbia, uh, available parking, a garage of some sort, or any type of driveway that you could have parked in, in its history? Uh, yes. And why is it no longer there? Because I renovated. You, you converted the garage to some living accommodation or whatever? What, uh, was, the, what was the renovation that, that, that made it not possible to park there? Uh, uh, I just put, put, I just create, created living space. I see. It. Okay. Expanded your living area. Yeah. Okay. Um, is 
Does anybody else have any other questions? This letter, I'm not, you know, if she was really concerned I saw her today, she would be here. Well, uh, we'll read the letter for the, you know, for the record, and then you can, you know. um, then you can comment on the, on the letter. It'll make it easier. Okay. Um, there are two, actually. I'll go for the short one first. Um, the short one is from Jill Newstate at 19 Garfield, and it says to whom, doesn't apply to this case. To whom it may concern, I'm opposed to the alleyway being opened up as a parking lot. Uh, the alleyway parallel to Columbia uh, in regard to the Gerber variance. This alleyway butts my property, she says. Um, I guess the, the it runs behind would be her. off of Garfield. It would not, there would be no alley access. So that, that letter is, you know, her complaint doesn't apply okay. in this situation. Okay, and then um, the, from Kelly Pero, Piro? Pero. Um, who is um, 51 Columbia, she's written to Mr. Pearson, I'm unable to attend the BZA meeting tonight. Can you please present this letter? Um, Dear Board of Zoning Appeals, this letter is to, is to serve my, to express my disapproval of the variance requested by Mr. Kerber to permit an accessory use parking facility on a lot where no principal use exists. Um, from my understanding, Mr. Kerber wishes to purchase a residential lot and use it for a parking area. In doing so, he would be permitted to rent out a portion of his house. If this variance is granted and Mr. Kerber is able to turn a portion of his house into a rental, I'm fearful of how it would impact property values in the area. I personally bought my house on Columbia Avenue because of the low number of rental properties in the area. I believe there has been a recent trend towards having permanent residents in the area and would hate to see a rental property parenthetically, even a duplex, which I'm told is what Mr. Kerber is planning, emerge and destroy this de development. I'm also concerned about the appearance of such parking lot right in the middle of two residential homes. Again, how will this impact property values? Based on the above, I disapprove the lot being used for parking. Um, normally, we have uh, an opportunity for someone to speak in general comment or in opposition, but there is no one here who was sworn for speaking. Um, Steve, I believe, has made his general comments. He may have some additional. But um, at the point at which someone makes um, a, um, a statement against the granting of the variance, then you have the opportunity to rebut. So let's assume she'd just been here and said this, and then if you make your rebuttal, please. Well, I am not planning a duplex. The, the lot that she is referring to, Seven Garfield, is not between two other residences. For some reason, she probably has, that's what it said at the end of it, I believe. Yeah, there's something uh, to the, eight Garfield is to the right of it. What's, I mean, to the left of it. What's on the other side it's of it? It's a vacant lot. Oh, so it's two vacant lots. It's You've got seven vacant is vacant, down. and then uh, uh, six three, is also. Three and five three is Three and vacant. five, okay, so additional vacant lots. Yeah. So, so and, you, you know, and she cannot even see it from her place. So you're going to buy this piece of property to put four parking spaces in it? Exactly. It. Okay. So I'm trying to comply with the code, right. you know, as, as best yeah. as I can. Well, yeah. maybe, unless I'm missing something, this is for us to discuss, uh, or for me to find out. Uh, if he's buying the purpose, the, the property, and he's uh, deed restricting for the, you know, to use within 250 feet, then why is he here? Because it's not because permitted it's in our one district, and it's not permitted. Because, because that alley deal is, is not permitted. It's not permitted in our one house, honestly. Mm -hmm. It's an accessory use, so presumably you would have a primary use with parking attached, okay. rather than just a parking lot. But if this was downtown, it would be okay. Yes, but it's not downtown. Yeah. It's an our one district. Yeah. Yeah. The the yeah the approved use for um, an area like guess, that would be I, if I, was, I, he no. was building a dwelling and then making that parking area beside it. I also don't un don't understand, even though it would be allowed in an R one district, why these are presented to us as stacked parking, four spaces crammed into one area of the lot and stacked. Uh, is it the, because of the nature of the lot? Uh, uh, I just, you know, drew up a plan, and it's within the code to have stacked parking in our yes, well, if it's convenient for your renters. <clears throat> I can clarify that for you. Okay. Mm -hmm. The maximum uh, width of a uh, cut for a driveway onto a street in an R1 or R2 zone is 20 feet. Okay. That's the maximum width that you're allowed right. to open up out to the street. 
Well, if you still have the whole uh, property, then you can come in and then park in parallel on the side or you know, a yeah. variety of options. I'm just kind of a curious. Right. Well, the one thing that stack parking does do is minimize the uh, earth disturbing area mm -hmm. and minimizes impervious surface and the destruction of mm -hmm. you know, vegetation. It's just not very practical if, if two cars in the front can get out because there's two cars behind them. Right. In R1 and R2 zones, you can most people just have a single wide driveway. So I don't know about you, I go down the street quite often and somebody's backing out so the person who's stacked in can get out. And that's another reason why I think there's a limitation on the width of the driveways, um, too, in R1 and R2 zones. There's an assumption that everybody there is familiar with each other. They know their comings and goings, and so they can adjust themselves as, you know, as they park in the driveway. A lot of times it's family members also. Um, uh, there are quite a few places where you see a single wide driveway just because of access problems. They'll turn off and just completely park in the backyard, and turn the whole backyard into a parking area just so everyone can get their car in and out any time that they want to. Um, but again, that, you know, that takes away green space. Hmm. So, yeah, okay. You could. Okay, thank you. That helps. Um, there is nobody else to speak, so I think, Steve, unless you have something else for us, we'll just close the discussion from the floor and begin ours if we need additional discussion, or are we ready to consider a motion? Anybody want to make a motion? Do we need to consider that condition that Steve was talking about? Which condition? Condition that as long as uh, this property is not developed, if it's developed, uh, the house is put in there, then this four parking space would be, would not uh, serve the 52 Columbia. Oh, right. Um, because the variance is going to stay with the property, right? Right. Well, as long as the as long as the property is not being developed and it stays as a vacant lot, well, then this four space could be used for 52 Columbia. Well, is that how we want to phrase the? Oh, we might want to say three instead of four. Okay. Well, he has to have four. Oh, yeah, he's to have four. Yeah. Yeah. To have four. He's required if he's going to rent. You have to do that than just say it's only only for 52 Columbia. Mm -hmm. Because and there are to other be vacant used, lots yeah, to, be, to be used only for 52. Because the other vacant lots, but if you start building there and you say, well, we need parking space, we go back over here and use more parking space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it'd be to be used only for the Columbia <coughs> property, and uh, as long as it's not a, as long as it, it is not sold to be used as a uh, yeah once once it's sold and it, for the purpose of building a single uh, an additional dwelling, then it would uh, lose its mm -hmm. variance for a parking lot. Is that the essential the essence of what we're trying to do? And you're the word Smith. I mean, one of you. If it's if it's sold or if it's uh, because it's deed restricted, you know. So then I don't know sold what that happens lease. to that. Sold or lease. When when it's deed restricted and you sell it, it still goes with the deed, right? Well, if, yeah. Unless we say no, but if, we, if he leases it out, sold or lease, mm -hmm. then it should be no and void. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, that would also protect the future buyer yeah, it's also. It's got a real restriction on it there. Mm, right. If it's, if it's either sold or leased for whatever purpose, then the um, variance it's ceases. It's, uh, it's boring, yeah. yeah. Well, can't we just accomplish that by saying as long as such use is restricted um, to residents of 52 Goffey? Well, well, 52 is Garfield is, on. oh, <clears throat> Garfield's not going to have any residents. I don't mean Garfield, I mean Columbia. Yeah, but yeah. You, if, if it's lease, he still has access. I'm leasing out my house, and so these parking spaces go with the house. 
Right. So they would still be the residents of 52 Columbia who are using it. Yes, I'm not following. I'd like to say more restrictive. Okay, so you like to say what? You, you do yeah, Just with so, sold or lease. That's the end of it. Somebody else has to do this. And I, uh, How would you like I might be able to help you. Mm -hmm. um, the code talks about parking on a lot in an R1 or R2 zone for the exclusive use of the residents. So, mm -hmm. for example, the condition could be um, uh, that the four parking spaces um, be for the exclusive use of the residents of 52 Garfield. Well, that's what I was trying to say here. Right. And I think that would cover it, really. Right. And then. Um, you want to have the other, I guess, a second condition then that the, uh, um, and if such use ceases for any reason, that the uh, variance is void. Okay, so we've got it. Such use ceases. What if? That would cover sale, lease, or any other thing that you could. So you're really saying if 52 Columbia is sold, no, that Garfield is sold. Um, I think the concern is for the parking. That's why I said for the exclusive right. use of the residents. I of think 52. that covers it because mm -hmm. then if nobody's living at 52, they can't use this and this can't be used by anybody else except 52. Right. It would be nice if uh, you know, it was currently in Mr. Kerber's ownership, then it could be deed restricted and you wouldn't have to worry about it you know, being sold off without being deed restricted. Um, there wouldn't be the necessity then to require, you know, to have the other condition. Um, to try to safeguard the parking that it didn't disappear and 52 Columbia still have renters, let's say. Right. Hmm. But I think Mr. Kerber had indicated, excuse me, but Mr. Kerber had indicated that he would deed restrict. Hmm. Um, when he has the property in his if, When he was ownership. able to purchase the property. So you could also, I suppose, attach that as a condition too. As soon as the property um, is in his ownership that it will be deed restricted um, to 52 Columbia for the purpose of parking. That would mean that at no future time would it be possible to sell that lot as a building lot for a, a house. No, it would be deed when somebody did a title when there was a title search on the property, they would find that four parking spaces. At, at Seven Garfield were always dedicated to 52 Columbia. So it would never be possible to build a home on that, on that site? Um, maybe he doesn't want to do that. I mean, maybe we should advise him not well, to do that and just go with the variance, and the variance would be void if it's sold, so that would be clear for him. I'm not offering any advice to Mr. Kerber. I'm just yeah. restating what he had said. Mm -hmm. You know, just if once you sell it, then it's clear, land is clear. If you sell what? If he sells the property. Which, which property? The, the I Garfield? Mean, Garfield, after he buys it, he sells it, then uh, this entire variance is void. He and would no what, longer be able to rent the house and he would know. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's what he's going to take. And then the seven Garfield would be clear. Anybody would buy it, there would be no restricted deed, and there would be nothing on it. I think that would be to his benefit. Well, again, we are always making these rules that mean that the code enforcement office has, and this would be in the computer, but that means that they have to follow up and see if this lot is sold, mm -hmm. then they would lose the permit to rent in 52 Columbia. Right. Okay. So. The variance for the parking is void, and 52 Columbia loses its parking, its its rental. Rental privileges, yeah. Well, that's pretty restrictive. Steve? Well, and he wants to keep it forever, that's fine, but you know. Okay. Is that manageable? Um, as I mentioned several times, each parking variance that you grant um, requires some follow-up because with the code office, because normally it's associated with a rental. Uh, any decision of the board is contained in the file of a rental property. An officer looks at that every two years at a minimum. So um, 
at least every two years there would be an inspection that would indicate if the officer was diligent in looking in the file to see any special conditions that were attached to it, that a verification that that property at 7 Garfield was still in the ownership of the owner of 52 um, Columbia. Um, okay. e each of these is a challenge to follow up on. Mm -hmm. Um, there are people, but some sure. of, for example, there are a lot of people that are very good about when you've granted, uh, well, I know, for example, uh, Chris Pyle, he was granted um, um, remote parking across the street from his house on Elliott over in Mold Machines parking lot. He just, he has to, people have to provide verification of their parking every year. And Mr. Pyle came in and gave us a copy of his, of his parking lease. That's one. That's one. <laughs> Yeah, okay. some people, like I say, some people come in and do it voluntarily, <coughs> others, others don't, but it's at least caught every two years. Okay. All right. And again, too, as I mentioned, there's, um, what I'm trying to do now is bring code officers up in some zoning um, enforcement also, and they actually review zoning permits because I want them familiar with any kind of construction or anything that's going on in, the, in their neighborhood. Um, become familiar with the neighborhood in general, but especially if it's rental property. So I'm getting them more involved, and uh, so at least this, you know, this staff of officers would know that. And if they opened up the 52 Columbia file, you know, they would know that the conditions. Um, probably this is a, a lot of times too. I put copies of the minutes of this meeting in a, in a rental folder because a lot of times the minutes are much more clear than the uh, resolution. Okay. <laughs> well, we try. <laughs> I guess what I'm trying to say is you can you can get a feel for the yeah, discussion right. how it went okay. and what the intent was. Okay. Thank you. All, All right. right. Do we then, do we think we have one? <laughs> well, I don't know. We have so much stuff here that it's hard to see what we really need. So let's just put a tentative variance okay. and then we can, then we can discuss we can shape it. it up. Okay. About that. All right. Okay. Um, I move that we grant a variance to the property at 7 Garfield Avenue from 230401B2 to permit an accessory use parking facility on a lot where no principal uses exist. So long as such use remains the ex in the, for the exclusive use of the residents at 52 Columbia. And the property at Garfield is deed restricted to 52 Columbia as soon as the um, appellant takes ownership of the property. I thought we were going to take the deed restriction. Okay. Out. Is that, should we do that? Yeah. I'm willing to, is that okay? That's okay. Okay. Omit that. Okay. So it's to be in the exclusive use of the residents of 52 Columbia with the provision that if 7 Garfield is sold, the variance is void, and the uh, 52 Columbia will therefore lose its rental privileges. Perfect. Because it will have no parking. Second. Okay. How's that, Paul? <laughs> He's holding his head again. <laughs> okay. Hmm. Okay. Well then, we have a variance um, motion. Motion, and we and you seconded it, right? Right. Okay. So let's go through the findings and see how they fall. Um, okay. For this property, what is the? Now we're talking about the property at Seven, seven Garfield. Garfield. Yeah, which makes the, the, really the variance weird. is for because Seven you Garfield. You can't really separate it from Fifty Two Columbia. Yeah. Makes but the really variance weird. is for... Yeah, my only other concern is that we are giving a variance to property 7 when the present owner is not here, so... Well, well, yeah, well, that's not we necessary. We, we've yes. we've done that. Yeah. Um, to buy the property. Anybody okay. can request it. Okay, so what is the hardship about 7 Garfield? You know, at the, pr the way he was explaining, I didn't see any immediate hardship, but if uh, he wants to comply with the code, if he may want to have a couple of renters, then... then He's trying to supply the parking space off the street for the renters. The hardship, I, I think, is that there is that alley, which is 
um, unimproved between it. But remember, it. what we're really talking about yeah. is what is the hardship that would accrue to Mr. Kerber well, that would be unnecessary to um, the yeah. intent and purpose of the code? I don't see a hardship. He had a structure that he converted over mm -hmm. to more living space, and that was his choice. That's self creating. Yeah, I think that's probably true. Yeah. Since, yeah. And anyway, it's not Garfield. Uh, well, what about if you say he's right now parking in the street, and that's 52 kilometers. Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. And yeah. and you know, you know, maybe he doesn't want to be on the street. He just well, he's find got a place. he's got one person living in the house. He's parking on the street, and he did have a place to park, which he used up for a different purpose. Mm -hmm. So he eliminated his own parking. Place. But no one ever uses those parking places. That's a different that's issue, and. I don't think <laughs> okay, we've closed the discussion, so... Um, um, yeah. Okay. It, many people find it just as easy to park on the street as to have, you know, to go into their driveways, and so it, it's not uncommon, especially in an urban area, to enclose the um, garage, and I've seen it all over the place, all over the country, and turn it into living space. Um, but that's a permanent, that's a decision that you make and then you're sort of, you have the consequence of it, which is that you don't have any place for anybody else to park either. Sure. Um, but Seven Garfield doesn't even have a house on it and it doesn't have a problem with parking because there is no house on it. The only reason there's a problem with parking is because it's wanted to be used as parking for a different property. Um, I don't see that that is an exceptional circumstance. I mean, there are... Well, I mean, there's nothing in the law itself that presents itself as exceptional, except that it needs a variance because it has no property on it, mm -hmm. which is not allowed by the code, typically. It, yeah. But then we'd be going against the R1 code for the whole area. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, it is, a, I think, a buildable lot, but... Um, it would be a challenge to build on it, but I think it's still buildable. So it is, um, I think the preservation of equal property rights might be um, a problem to find. Well, let's go to the next one. So, well, the property rights one. Um, the next one. That's number three, yeah. Preservation of equal property rights. The exceptional circumstance, um, did we find any exceptional we didn't circumstance? Discuss it. Well, we, we didn't, we didn't. I mean, there's nothing about the lot itself mm -hmm. which is exceptional in size or shape or topography. What would be exceptional is that we would be giving a variance to an accessory use mm -hmm. only without a principal. But that's, that's not exceptional to the lot itself. It's created because right. of what he wants to do. Right. The lot okay. So, property rights in this area, uh, would it literally interpreting the code deprive the appellant of rights commonly enjoyed by others in the same vicinity? Well, it looks like we are limiting his right if we don't give him the variance, so he, he won't be able to enjoy having renters. Well, well, every time we don't give a variance, we've limited somebody's right to do something that they wanted yeah. to do. In this case, we're giving a variance because this is not allowed. So the question is, is this is Well, this if we a give right? the variance, we may be able to give him equal right to him as the other neighbors who can have renters. Do other neighbors have parking lots? Do well, other neighbors yeah. have parking that's, lots? That's a, that's a special circumstance. That's service. the question, not can he have renters, mm -hmm. but should this be a parking lot? Yeah, I, I, I fully understand. I'm just saying that, okay. you know, the special circumstances applies to him, but not the rest of the people. Mm -hmm. It applies to a lot. Four parking spaces with no property, uh, no house on it. Okay. Is this the variance, the minimum required to make reasonable use of the property at 7 Garfield? I don't believe so. Because? It can be used for lots of other things that are perfectly within the code. Like building a house. It's a little already all the lot. What's the next one? Uh, well, the four that he's requested, according to Steve, is required. And when I read this uh, opposition letter, I thought there's going to be about 25 cars in there. But, you know, it's, 
it's not going to be all cars everywhere, parking lot. It's just like four parking spaces, okay. so you can see it's minimal. If you're going to build a parking lot, a, a parking lot for four cars only would be minimal. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. Except that uh, there are plenty of other uses for the property beside mm -hmm. um, yeah. this. But there is someone who came late who wants to speak. Do you want to hear him or not? No, we're in okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. Um, all right. The, the absence of detriment one, which is number five, would um, granting the variance be of substantial detriment to adjacent properties, and would it Im materially impair the purposes of the code of the public interest. I find that one detriment to the neighborhood for those people who think this is going to be just a parking space or, or we have two letters in here, so apparently those two people are concerned. Well, I think more than just the two people, the question for us is, is this in the spirit of the code mm -hmm. or does this impair the purposes of the code? It's not. I agree okay. with that so, I mean, why is it in the code that you need to have a house mm -hmm. to have parking in an R1 district? So, does that undermine this finding or not? Perhaps not. The next one, the last one, is not of a general nature. The variance, um, we have to decide whether the variance that's being sought is of a general or recurring nature such the situation would more reasonably be handled by changing the law. Hmm. I think that the city council need to look at the functioning of R1 and that, yeah, there probably should be some kind of change in the law. If there, if they are, if there are to be parking lots in R1, it would, it would mm -hmm. reasonably be handled by changing the law because right now it's quite specifically not permitted. Okay. Can, can look at property have accessory building before the principal if you say maybe in the future there will be a principal building? Can you can you build the accessory building first? No, I have been the card. <clears throat> the code doesn't specifically say that, but for example, a lot of people will say, um, I want to build this garage and live in it while I'm working on the house, and then they never get around to building the house. Hmm. So it's not allowed. So you have to have, before you can have an accessory use, it has to be accessory to something. It can't be accessory to... Yeah. You have to have the principal use established first. Okay. All right. Well, are we ready to, um, Mr. Chairman, to vote? Chairman, I call for a vote. Hmm? Yeah. Call for a vote. Yeah. Are we ready? Hmm. Um, Greg? I vote no. Okay. I have to waste a no also, although it's very, very close, because uh, we didn't meet all the six criteria. Okay. Really? Okay. I vote no. No. And I, too, cannot find for the case, so. Uh, so that's a five to zero fall. And um, that's the only case that we had on the agenda this evening. However, there are several other things to do. One, before I forget it, um, I went to the website um, yesterday or the day before and noted not, it's not for the Board of Zoning Appeals. The city website it lists the meeting time for um, the Board of Zoning Appeals as 7.30. I don't know if that's why we have someone who arrived at the hour he did, but um, I don't know to whom I... Who would, who would correct that? I can, I can ask Scott Thompson. Okay. Yeah, I think it needs to be corrected. So. The, the website currently is in a little bit of disarray because of new office holders coming in. Uh -huh. And for example, you can't access the code anymore. Yeah, I noticed that too. <laughs> so, um, okay. you know, I had promised and I still will get you a copy of the code on a disk, yeah. but then it will be available. Okay, uh, great. Also, Chairman, uh, I make a online eventually. In West oh, yeah, I'm just almost getting there. Um, that would be good. And then um, we do have the next item on the um, agenda is the disposition of the minutes, and has everyone had a chance to read them? Mm -hmm. yes. And I sent a comment present. to the email to everyone that in the very last, it says that Steve was going to go to the planning commission or planning to tell that to change the expiration date of the officers to December 31, and I believe we all we, we, we decided not to change that to be um, January 1st, 31st. 
Yeah, I think we decided that it wasn't going to make any difference. Yes, under other businesses. Yeah, it yeah. wasn't. It wasn't going to. Um, it wasn't going to affect anything one way or another. Is is I think what we decided. It was yeah. right here. Um, so do we so, want to just strike that. Yeah, and Steve, don't go to that planning. What is it? Planning. Uh... Yeah, the mayor and the city council would have to. Yeah. Um, all right, we don't need to make that change anyway, so that's going to be one thing that we're not changing in our um, uh, rules of procedure. Um, however, we, I do have um, a question. Does, do we think the expiration date, the reason that we were discussing it, Next door, well, before we get to that, let's go ahead and with that one change, um, do we have a mo motion to approve the minutes? Yes. Okay. Then, um, all, all nice. okay, okay. Nice. then that's one change we want to do. Um, however, that did bring up for me, uh, for the organizational me uh, meeting, the question of the expiration of the terms. Um, is there any particular reason why it's necessary for the, I mean, there, there's, for the mayor to wait until the absolute expiration of a term before considering um, a re-up for the uh, person or um, uh, considering a new appointment? Is it something that um, we could request to be um, considered in advance of the expiration? Since the expiration date is known, um, we could start looking in advance for either a reconfirmation of the, of the person or um, a new um, replacement for, for, the, for the retiring member. What does everybody think about that? I, I don't think that's the mayor's discretion. Yeah, can we encourage the mayor in his discretion to act a bit more timely? So you don't like it today. You got the word just this morning that yes, you were. Morning, this morning. Yeah, right. You Still weren't expecting to be here today until, I until the, today. I serve at the grace of the mayor. Yeah, right. You wanted the deadline. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just thinking that it, I don't see why it has to be a. a you know, we, we have to get all jammed up with, with this. It worked out fine. Well, I did well, in this I case. I can make a motion that I have the chairperson meet and renegotiate with the mayor. I will do so that. I got a second. I'll be happy to do that if you guys want me to. I'll, I'll go and talk with Paul about it. <laughs> All right. Um, the uh, let's see. The only other thing about the organizational <coughs> meeting is we have to decide whether we want to um, make any other kinds of changes to uh, the way we operate, or if everything <coughs> is to be. Con Continued as it, we have been doing it. Can we have a motion to just so moved? Okay. Anybody? Any, any any objections? Um, the one thing left on that thing is: Do you still want me to keep on doing yes, this do. stammer, stammer, stammer yes, stuff? We, we do. <laughs> okay. yes. I am willing to continue, but I am also willing to have somebody else do this. Nope, you're good. Nope. Right. Any objections? Okay. No. Can I say objection? No. no. Oh, I already said I didn't. All right. <laughs> in that case. You miss the meeting, we'll let you back in. Anyway. Uh -huh. All right. Well, okay. In that case, um, we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. This is a meeting of the Athens Board of Zoning Appeals. The meeting is called to order at this time at 7 p.m. 05. Um, the date is March 11, 2008. The board consists of five members and two alternates. An alternate takes full part in discussions of the board and becomes a voting member in the absence or conflict of interest of a regular member. Um, this evening, present this evening, are um, uh, board members Roger Gruzer, John Golzi, uh, Hector Flores, myself, Muriel Frederick, Betty Hollow, Michelle Draybold, and uh, not yet present, but we're expecting him, um, Greg Lavelle. Uh, also present are Zoning Administrator Steve Pil Pearson, Paul Eschenbacher, our Acting Secretary, and City Attorney Pat Lang. Um, the board operates according to the following procedure. The chair will name and describe the case. 
The zoning administrator will cite specifics of the refusal of the case. The appellant or a representative then will state the case for granting the appeal. Testim mm. Testimony next will be taken from those who support granting the appeal, then those who wish to speak in general comment, and those who support denial of the appeal. Following all testimonies, the board will receive uh, concluding remarks from the appellant. A discussion from the floor then will be closed. The board will deliberate and render a decision. Under Athens City Code Section 2307-03B, the board has the power to grant such variances from the code as will not be contrary to the public interest so that the spirit of the code shall be observed, public safety and welfare secured, and substantial justice done. Athens City Code requires that variances from the code shall not be granted unless the board makes specific findings of fact based directly on the evidence provided to it that each and every one of the following six criteria are met. Pra practical difficulty or undue hardship. There must exist a practical difficulty or an undue hardship caused by exceptional conditions pertaining to the specific piece of property. Exceptional circumstances. There must exist exceptional circumstances or conditions applying to the property or its intended use that do not in general apply to properties in the same zoning district. Preservation of equal property rights. It must be determined that literal interpretation of the code would deprive the appellant of rights commonly enjoyed by others in the same vicinity, while granting the variance would not convey a special privilege. Minimum variance. It must be determined that the variance is the minimum required to make reasonable use of property Number five, the absence of detriment. It must be determined that granting of the variance will not be of substantial detriment to adjacent properties, nor materially impair the purposes of the code or the public interest. And finally, not of a general nature. The variance sought must not be of a general or recurring nature, such that the situation would more reasonably be handled by changing the law. The board also is empowered to hear and decide applications for conditional use, substitution for non-conforming use, temporary uses, and appeals where it's alleged by the appellant that there's an error in the decision made by the zoning administrator regarding enforcement or interpretation of the code, as well as requests for interpretation of the code. Any person who's aggrieved by the decision of the board may file an appeal to the Court of Common Pleas. Such petition must be filed within 30 days after the mailing of the board's resolution to the appellant. Tonight there are three cases on the agenda. Number 0715V for 38 North Court Street, which is zoned B2. The Wasserman Group LLC is the appellant. Number 0804V for 1055 East State Street, which is zoned M. John Valentour for East State Street Development Company is the appellant. And number 08-03 for 11 and 13 West Simpson Avenue, which is zoned B3, three wide <clears throat> excuse me, entertainment is the impellent. The board is required by law to take testimony under oath. Anyone wishing to speak, please stand to be sworn. Do you swear that the testimony you will give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do too. Thank you. Um, this evening, um, Steve Pearson has a list for anyone who is present to sign in. And um, if you wish to speak this evening, I'd appreciate it if you um, just check off after your name. And I, I think you still have it, right? And if you haven't already yeah, signed it, it's right there at the, at the table. <clears throat> Trying something new. <clears throat> All right. Our first case this evening is number 0715V. For, 13, for 38 North Court Street, it's zoned b 2 b and Wasserman Group LLC is the appellant, um, requesting a variance. Um, there was a variance previously granted to this address uh, with the condition that any change be reviewed, and this will be a change. Um, the, all of the people, let's see, who all spoke, the people who were present Last time this variance was went through were uh, Mr. Goldie, Mr. Bruiser, Ms. Hollow, Michelle Drabold, and you also, right? Hector. <clears throat> so we've got everyone 
who was present. So since I did not hear the original case, I am going to simply ask the questions and, and participate, but all the, the, the voting members, the ones who voted last time, will be the ones who will make any uh, decision this time, I think. Is, I'm just going to sort of excuse myself from voting on it, okay. because I didn't really hear it the first time, nor uh, did I really participate in the second time. So in any case, having said that, Steve, could you um, <coughs> go up to the lectern and tell us um, anything that we need I, to yeah, know? I or up there. you don't need to, you can just stay right there. Okay. New format. Um, first thing is I'd just like to maybe call a point of order. Mm -hmm. If there are not five voting members, because I understand Mr. Abel has recused herself from hearing this case, oh, then you have to offer the appellant the opportunity to continue until the next meeting. I, since, uh, I'll vote on this one. Just so you might have a little I'll more comfort level on it, the board originally granted a variance. Um, there's been a second case heard. Um, based on one of those conditions, and this is a third, right. essentially a third case. <clears throat> so the information presented in this case will be new. All right. Because then it's I'm a, perfectly capable of listening to new um, information and going with it. It's. Um, I thought it would be helpful for it to be just the ones who had originally decided. But if that can't be, then I'm perfectly happy to continue. So. Right, Mr. Abel had. On the other two proposals, didn't have a conflict in this particular case. She does. I see. For the particular Sorry. new proposed parking area. Oh, I see. Okay, that makes sense. Let's go ahead then. Okay, um, I think as you previously mentioned, um, Wasserman Group LLC um, had obtained a variance for 38 North Court Street to allow residential occupancy um, for 10 tenants where they only had three on-site parking spaces. The variance was granted to allow seven of the ten required to be off-site and located at a parking lot at the intersection of North McKinley and Mill Street. That variance was granted with the condition that if there were changed circumstances, Wasserman Group LLC would return to the board um, for review of the case. <coughs> um, subsequently, there was a proposed change and that the parking be moved from the corner of North McKinley and Mill Street to the Athens Mold Machine parking lot on Elliott Street. That case was heard and that request essentially to exchange variances was denied. Now we're at a third case where a third parking area um, is proposed to be substituted for the one originally granted variance. Um, this proposed parking area is closer than that originally granted variance. Um, the proposal is to have seven um, leased parking spaces at Christ the King Church, which is at the intersection of uh, Stewart Street and Mill, as opposed to the original parking that was proposed further east at North McKinley and Mill. Um, this parking is paved, drained, striped, Lighted. Okay. Does that mean that he's dropping the, the first parking at uh, <coughs> McKinley and Mill? That was 10 spaces? No, that was seven. seven. No, it was seven. <coughs> it was seven. So he's just asking him to drop those seven and come to this closer by. Uh, closer by. That's correct. And that's okay. And now, an improved parking area as yes. opposed to unimproved. <coughs> in yes, sir. Um, one of the things that happened at the, <clears throat> excuse me, at the second appeal, um, Law Director Hunter had passed on to the board through uh, Prosecutor Mike Miller that the original variance would have to be rescinded if this variance was granted. In other words, you couldn't have two, two variances running on the same piece of property, 38 North Court Street. That would be basically the same condition as this, if we approve the king, then the other one is null and void. Well, I well, believe I believe what will happen is, and you didn't have to consider rescinding the original variance because the second application was denied. Right. Um, that would be the same case tonight if this right. application is denied. However, the way I understood Mr. Miller's explanation was that if this variance was granted, you would also have to have a motion, second, and a vote to rescind, rescind the, first. the first variance on recommendation of the, uh, the law director. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, anybody else have any other questions for Steve? Um, then um, would the 
representative for the Wasserman Group, please step up <coughs> and state your name and address for the record. Yes, please. And uh, please affirm that you've previously been sworn. Yes, ma'am, I have. I, I do swear to tell the truth, the whole truth. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Rick Wasserman. Uh, I own the land and property at 38 North Court Street, Athens, Ohio. Um, address 1296 Vanderhoof Road, Coolville, Ohio. Uh, if you'll forgive me, I'm, I'm just, I'm still a little bit confused as to what exactly I'm presenting. Um, what I've come to ask for is for a modification of the existing variance. Essentially, I, my understanding is once the variance had been issued, I'm essentially under the supervision of the board, and if I request a change of any sort, I have to come back to the board and request that. So I'm not planning to present the entire case again from the beginning, and I hope that that would please the board. Um, that would, and now that uh, Steve has done a, done a very good job of, of sort of giving it to me in a nutshell what the original case was, and it was, yeah. No, you don't okay. have to do it all over again. <laughs> okay, very well then. Uh, I won't take much of your time at all. Um, I'm appearing before you tonight again to request modification for my existing variance 0715V, granted on October 9th, 9th of 2007. Uh, the existing variance uh, provides for the use of offsite parking approximately 2,200 feet from the proposed development. Uh, now been able to secure some parking that is some 600 feet closer to the building. Parking which was unavailable to me at the time that I applied for the original variance. Uh, I believe the closer lot serves the interest of my tenants, it serves the interest of the city code, and the interests of the public in general better than the parking that I'm now permitted to use, and so I'm requesting permission to essentially switch parking to this new lot, which is located, as the code director said, at Christ the King University Parish, uh, the corner of Mill Street and uh, Stewart Street. I believe this modification serves the interest of everyone for the following several reasons. One is quite obviously quite a bit closer. Uh, the, the current distance would be about the equivalent of two city blocks from the building. If you were to measure, for instance, from the, the college gate to the corner of, uh, say, where the BP station is, that's exactly the same uh, distance that my building will be to the new parking. Uh, this lot is lighted, this lot is paved, this lot drains, uh, and this lot is already in use for the purpose for which I propose. Um, there have been a lot of discussion that's already been stipulated about why the development itself is a positive thing and, and, and warrants a, a variance, which I realize is a very high bar to cross. Uh, this particular building's second floor is empty and has been so for about 30 years. Uh, the fire chief has previously commented in the materials of the original variance uh, that a vacant space is far more likely to suffer a damaging fire uh, than an occupied space. Uh, the building currently is not sprinkled, and uh, this development will make it a sprinkled space, making it quite a bit safer than most of the housing that is currently uptown and also offers, I believe, reduced risk, reduced risk to the adjacent property owners by containing any potential fire. Uh, we recently had a fire in a restaurant that some would say is uh, similar to mine, though really I don't think their food is as good. Um, <laughs> but uh, so, so we should remember that these things can and do in fact happen and, uh, and the reduce of a fire risk is not a small consideration. Furthermore, the Athens Comprehensive Plan encourages uh, the development of spaces exactly like this one for mixed-use housing on the second floor and third floor, uh, commercial space on the first floor. And I think that this space is likely to be habited by uh, college students, thereby reducing the burden on, uh, on the local neighborhoods and uh, also hopefully slowing the, uh, the conversion of owner-occupied housing to, to rental housing. Uh, for this reason, this development is supported by the East Side Neighborhood Association. The original packet for the variance in October has a letter from them supporting it. And uh, I, I think you also received a letter from Leslie Schaller, who was one of the original uh, folks on the Comprehensive Plan Committee, also uh, indicating her support for this. In conclusion, uh, I'll say once again that <coughs> I don't seek in any way to skirt or subvert the housing code only to meet its requirements. Uh, by providing one parking space for every tenant that will inhabit this building, <coughs> three of them on site and the other seven at the closest destination for which I've been able to secure. I, I would say also very quickly that, you know, at the last, the last time I was here in December, 
uh, was not successful in, in getting a modification. And, uh, and a member of the board at, at the end of the meeting said to me, you know, don't, don't give up because I've often seen people go through this process and then find something after a denial that's closer than they originally thought. And I left kind of shaking my head because I knew that I had called every property owner in the, in the area. But when I re-canvassed, I was able to find, uh, you know, that I'd been given some wrong information by, by one of the people that I had canvassed and, and that they were willing to do a long-term lease for parking that included overnight. The key problem seems to be that most people who own parking close to uptown don't want people in their spaces overnight. And so it's very hard to rent for this sort of thing. So most of the publicly available lots and the churches and that sort of thing that are within, say, 500 or 1,000 feet of the building simply will not rent to anyone who's parking there overnight. And that was the problem that I had. Uh, so as I said, the, the parking that I'm now proposing was not available to me in December, but I certainly hope that uh, you'll look favorably upon this request this time. I thank you. Right. Yes, How long is the long-term lease? Uh, the, current, the current proposed lease that I think you have uh, in a packet is for eight years with an option for an additional eight after that. Thank you. Uh, give us the address of this new property. Well, it, it's just known as the I think it's just known as the corner of Mill Street and, and uh, Stewart Street. I, okay. You know, that's a good... Uh, hang on a second. Uh, let me just see if the, if the lease actually specifies an okay. address. That's, that's probably close. Is that good enough? Okay. Yeah, this is a parking area behind um, two different buildings. The sanctuary has a Mill Street address. The offices and classrooms have a Stewart Street address. Okay. So you could pick either one, I guess, because it's immediately behind both those buildings with two separate addresses. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Um, is there anyone here present who would like to speak in favor of this variance? Or in general, in favor? If you'd come to the podium, please, and state your name and address for the record. Yeah. And were you previously sworn? Say again. Have you previously been sworn? I have. You have. Okay. And your name and address for the record. My name's William Giles. I live at 24 Fort Street, Athens. We've lived in that home for almost 27 years. I can't add very much to what uh, Mr. Wasserman has said, but if he has met all the conditions of the variance that was granted earlier, and in fact he has improved that situation, it seems to me that this is a win-win a situation. We all like to see sturdy old buildings rehabbed, and we hate to see them fall into disrepair. So I think it's a safety thing, and I think it's just a, a very good thing, and I would urge the <coughs> board to consider it favorably. Thank you. Any questions, anybody? Thank you. Is there anyone else present who would like to speak in favor? or in general comment? Uh, I believe Mr. Wasserman alluded to an additional letter of support that I just received today, yes. and you should each have a copy of it. It's from... The one from Leslie Schaller? One from Leslie Schaller, who's the uh, business developer for ACENET. Um, it references um, the comprehensive plan and encourages the board to look favorably on the modification request. Yes, we have it. We do. I needed... We do. I have it in front of me anyway. Yeah, Everyone we have, else has yeah, got it. We yeah, have copies. Okay. Thank, you. Right, thank you. Any other general comments? Is there? Yes. Did you? Have I you have not been sworn in. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. And your name and, rec and address for the record. Uh, Joan Kurnansky, 56 Mound Street. Um, I just have a question. I don't have any objection to the project. I, I think it meets with some of the ideas that many people have for the city of Athens. But I have a question about the parking, um, and that is when the church and its facilities need to use those spots, is there go going to be any conflict with the spots that are being rented out as opposed to the spaces that they need to use or are required to have for whatever functions they have? And that would, would be my only question, just so it wouldn't get bogged down in some I kind of... I would assume that a, a rented space is a rented space. It, it, I mean, he's, he's required to have it be available 
for rental 24 hours a day, every day. But um, perhaps when Mr. Wasserman comes back up, because he does have the last, um, he has the opportunity to speak last, we will make sure we ask him that. Okay, well, as much as uh, parking for the tenants of the upgraded apartment, uh, second floor upgraded apartment complex, the, um, the required parking for the, uh, the church and its services itself, do those conflict? I mean, is the church required to have X number of parking places? E well, yes. Okay. So has anyone checked that out to make sure? This just happened a long time ago once where someone was given a certain amount of places, but then the other business mm -hmm. didn't have sufficient yeah, parking. Be, and so that's my only question. Okay. Well, um, perhaps Steve may be able to answer the question, and if not, um, perhaps Mr. Wasserman will. Okay. Thank, Thank you for you. bringing it up. Thanks. Uh, is there anything that you can tell us about that, Steve? Sure. <clears throat> um, the requirement for a church is one parking spot for every six seats in the sanctuary. Now, I'm not a member of Christ the King and don't know how many seats they have, um, but there's a requirement for one parking spot for every six seats. So I don't, okay. you know, I don't know what uh, what well, the total seating is, but it would be seating divided by six okay. would give you the number of parking spots needed for that. Um, there's a separate for the business offices. It would be one for every 300 square feet. A very used, I believe it's one for every 300. Yeah, one for every 300 square feet of floor area. And then for the, uh, the teaching facilities and the Stewart Street um, building, it's um, one parking space for every 17 classroom seats. Okay, so. and would all of those um, requirements for separate uses at separate times have to be provided at all times? Tenants have, according to this lease, access to their specific parking spaces 365 days a year, 24 hours okay. a day. So that requires the church to specify which parking spaces belong right. to them. And that was also a requirement of the um, okay. variance that we gave initially. And right. I'll, I'll read well, that if to that's, you at some but point. that's in but that. But I was sure that that would, was in it's there. In, but the uh, whether or not variance. are we required? It, my my concern is whether at this point are we supposed. I don't think it's this board's place to have to go and check at the I church. I wouldn't think Maybe so either. It's no. probably the, um, the, the code of office itself needs to check with the church, I assume. It's the church's responsibility and the code office's responsibility. Yes, it's not church. our. Okay. I, I mean, nobody yes. suggested that I go count the seats, and so Good. I didn't. <laughs> I didn't yeah. either, so. Okay. so. If you'd like, I can verify the seating um, in the um, classroom space and then let you know. If it well, is. yeah, you know, after the fact, I'm, well, I think I'm going to assume we can that, put that we, in as a condition. We could, we could. That would be probably be the conservative thing to do. I would be happy cons uh, just assuming that the business office of the church knows what its business is. But uh, to be absolutely certain that that's the case, we can add that as a condition. Okay. All right. Um, is there anyone else present who would like to speak in general comment? or in opposition? And if not, then Mr. Wasserman, would you like to come up and have your final words? Yeah, I'll just address this, this last point just real quick. Um, the spaces that I'll be renting would not be newly rented spaces. They're spaces that they're currently renting to other students in the area. And in fact, this actual issue came up uh, in the discussions with uh, Father Marty Holler. And uh, you know they have really not all that many spaces in their lot that they actually do rent. There's one particular section of it that they have for that, and the other section is apparently serving all of the functions that they need to, to serve, and he assured me of that, and I'd be inclined to take the good father as a man of the word. So uh, I, think, I think that that's, that that's covered. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there any other questions anyone from the board has? If not, then all discussion from the floor is closed, and. I'm ready to hear 
a motion. Well, I'm going to just, um, I'm going to assume that we'll proceed the way we did before when Mr. Miller suggested that you can't really have two variances ahead of you at the same time. And we're not really modifying the first no. variance because I understand that Mr. Wasman was in fact not able to secure those leases. And so it's, I believe that's what his application says. So that really is moot. However, for our own purposes, I think we should see that that original variance is rescinded after, after we deal with seeing if he gets the variance for this new property. I agree. And then, we'll, then that would be perfectly clean. Okay. I would, yes. Okay, so I'm going to make a variance by, uh, a motion by reading the variance that we um, used last time, the same motion. So it will say, um, I move that we grant uh, a variance to the to um, 38 North Court Street uh, from Section 2311 Table B off-street parking requirements to permit residential occupancy of a structure with three on-site and seven off-site parking spaces where ten on-site parking spaces are required and that the seven off-site off parking spaces be located at um, Christ the King University University property, uh, which is at the corner of Christ the King Church, Church. okay, Mill and at uh, the corner of Mill and Stewart Street, with the condition that they be clearly specified as intended for, <coughs> provided for, and excluding all others used by appellant's tenants, and with the condition that if these conditions change at all at this particular parking lot, the appellant or the owner of 38 North Court Street would need to return to the board for a rehearing of the case in order to determine if the conditions could otherwise still be met. That's what we said the last time. It sounds like it so covers second. everything and okay. it's been moved and seconded. All right. Shall we consider the, um, the usual findings then? Or shall we just vote? Or are we? <laughs> we can just vote. I think we can just vote. <coughs> Probably so, because we've heard yes, all that. Yes, it's all been heard. It's not very different. Yeah. Okay. okay, and I read it, and I, okay. so it's, I haven't, didn't hear it before, but I did read the case. So, okay. all right then, in favor? Yes. 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 No. <laughs> I am in favor, so. Okay. Um, you're very consistent. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so now let's get a all new right. motion so. to vacate the variance that we granted to 38 North Court Street um, for parking off-site at, I believe it's 175 um, Mill Street. Okay. Uh, yeah. It was 175 Mill. 175 Mill. Okay. I've got a question. Yeah. Are we sure that he wants to yes. Uh, yes. let us rescind? He has no option. This is a conditional, he, he but this not? is a conditional. No, it's not conditional. No, mm -hmm. it it's just has a condition attached to it. It's not right. conditional. It is a variance, unless things should change for him. Um, so Which was the same as the previous. But in fact, he minutes. doesn't even have the spaces at the first property. He was unable finally yeah, to lease. Yeah, that. I'm just, so something no happens to this. He can't go back there no, because he can't lease them. He, he couldn't get the at the first. He, he comes back to the first property. No, he's he's no no more says right here that he was not. Okay, received a variance for remote parking from the building, but has not been able to secure the parking lease he was promised. Okay, so it doesn't have that lease, but just for cleanliness sake, let's get rid of that variance. Mm -hmm. He has this one. It's a better deal for him mm -hmm. and for his tenants. Let's get rid of the first yeah. one. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the, the first one is not really, it's just it's messing things up. So do we have a second for that? Is yeah. there a second? There's a second. Okay. Um, yes. 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 All right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this, the original uh, variance is rescinded by a vote of 5-0, and the new variance is passed by a vote of 4-1. Four four to one. Great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Hello, next. Our Here next case, um, and I thought by this time we would have Greg, Greg but he isn't present, so we'll just continue. Um, everyone else is prepared to hear this case, right? Mm -hmm. All right, good. Mm -hmm. uh, this next case is 0804V. It's for 1055 East State Street, zoned M, 
John Valentour is presenting for the East State Street Development Company, LLC, who are the appellants. Um, this is, um, they're requesting a freestanding sign uh, in variance from 230313I4D. Uh, on a premise where one freestanding sign is the permitted maximum, we'd like to have a second one. Um, Steve, can you give us the specifics of the refusal, if there's anything more than that? This, um, there is an approved sign um, at this location. Um, what you're, the sign that you're seeing um, in the information is an, an exact duplication of that sign already permitted. Um, this is at the old McBee site. Um, so it has, you know, a, and has two entrance exit points, mm -hmm. one on each extreme end of the property. Um, the sign ordinance does allow directional signs. Um, however, they're only allowed to be three square feet in area and three feet to the top um, to mark entrance and exit points. Um, so even though you might look at these signs being at the entrance as directional signs, by definition, they're not. Um, the problem is you're only allowed one freestanding sign, and this is a request then for a second mm -hmm. freestanding sign. Um, signs aren't very tall. Um, they're more like a monument sign as opposed to a, uh, what's commonly called a lollipop sign. So these are monument type signs, lower to the ground, um, and one to be located um, at each entrance exit point. Um, there is two-way traffic. At each of those points, there are wide access points to the street. Um, really, the, the problem is that there's no allowance for more than one sign. It doesn't matter if you own a third of an acre or you own 30 acres. Um, you're only allowed one freestanding sign. Um, the signs are not nearly as large as might be permitted. The one that was permitted was for just to approximately half the size of the sign that could be permitted there, a single sign. Uh, the face area could be up to 100 square feet. Um, the one that was permitted was right around 50. Mr. Golsey figures it at 56. So, you know, we're not talking about, lar we're not talking about large signs. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? All right, then we're ready to hear from the appellant. Yeah. <clears throat> if I might mention to you, you do have, um, Mr. Valentor's arguments in favor or in support of the request. I think it's going to be Provide those to you. John Valentor, RBC Architects, and I'm here representing the Stateside Technology Park, formerly the McBee Building, on East State Street. And I'm just going to go read through my findings and the reason we're here, which you all have a copy of up there as well. We request consideration for signage at this property. The site is the former McBee facility at 1055 East State Street. The property currently has two primary entrances, one at the east and one at the west end of the property. We have applied and received a permit for signage at the west entrance already from the city and are requesting permission to place an identical sign at the east entry of the property. The maximum, well, this is a little different. I thought the maximum allowable sign was 50 square feet. <clears throat> yeah, if I could correct that. I was working originally on the 100 foot assumption there was four lanes there it's three it's just three so i thought that so uh, 50 that square feet is the maximum not 100. in a three lane road 50 feet is the maximum square footage of the sign that's what we the sign we have 
applied for and received the permission for was 50 square feet, and we're asking for an additional 50 square feet at the end, other end of the property. But to be exact, I guess that would be 56 square feet because 48 by what is it, 168? That comes to about 50. 56 63. square feet. Okay. Right? 50 okay. Something just just to be more. exact, yeah. Okay. The property has 800 or 980 linear feet of street frontage. And I think that something that's important about this site, and that's why I gave you those photographs up there to show you, the property slopes away from East State Street. The fee actually sits downhill from the road. And this situation makes it a little difficult, actually very difficult, to identify the points of entry into the site off of East State Street. The alternative to placing signs at each entry, like we have proposed here, would be to place one in the middle, a double-sided sign. But I don't think, and we did not, the owners think, that this would be the best solution for this building. The signage, because of the right-of-ways and setbacks, will be 40 feet off of the roadway and set at a 45-degree angle. What we're trying to do is help identify where you, sp where you turn off of East State Street to get onto the property. These signs will have vegetation or uh, landscaping around them and also be externally lit. They will not be internally illuminated signs. And through the findings, the facility is intended to have multiple tenants. And rather than placing the company names on the East State Street signs, directional signage at the junctions of the access roads on the property will lead to a specific tenant. These signs are just intended to have this, I think I gave you a copy of what it was going to look like, Eastside Technology Park, and the address only. And the site plan that I showed you indicates that there's a complex of roads that run around on the property. After you get down off of the main access roads, that's where directional signs would be located towards the individual tenants. And the reason for this is that all the tenants will not be entering off into the main entry of the building. Some of the tenants might have access through side entrances on the property. And so we felt that it would be important to help guide people to where they needed to go once they got off the main road rather than have their names all set onto the main road itself. The granting of this variance will be in accord with the general purpose and intent of the code. The property has a large street frontage on a three-lane section of road that is surrounded by four lanes. The signage area we are asking for would be acceptable in most of this, this specific zone. Just this one section has not got a four lane. It's a four lane down the road, not too far, and it's a four lane or it's a five lane once you get back into Athens, which would make this size of the signage we were asking for acceptable. The variance will not be injurious to the area or detrimental to public welfare. In fact, in our opinion, it will provide a better defined entrance that will make access to the site safer. Right now, McBee, or it used to be the way McBee was, or Coca-Cola, or the only other real tenants on that area, don't have public really coming in and out of the site. For the most part, it was employees and maybe some salesmen every now and then. With the development of this facility, there's going to be more public access required to the site. And it, I think, would be advantageous to make that as easy and as simple as possible for people to identify where they need to get on and off the road to get into this specific area. And then they can find where they need to go within the complex. The particular circumstances and conditions which make this variance acceptable relate to the design of the original facility, which has two main entries into it, these access roads are at remote ends of the property, and they both drop in elevation off of East State Street, making it difficult to see them. The situation at the site does not apply in general to other properties in the zone. Most of the other properties in the zone adjoin a four-lane road or more. This property has a three-lane road, and also the speed limit is increased from the more congested retail areas in the zone from 25 to 35 miles an hour in front of this property. Denial of the variance will perpetuate 
an existing poor situation, which can be corrected with minimal impact. Use of the building or property will not be denied, but better public access will be provided. When McBee operated in the facility, very little public access to the site was associated with the operation of the business, as I indicated. Now the facility will have multiple tenants, many of them serving customers, which will need better directional information will be provided to improve the functioning of this specific property. The hardship that will be created would be related to traffic flow into and out of the property. Public access and directions to the various tenants of the building should be, could be affected by denial of this variance. And based on a 35 mile an hour speed limit of the road in front of the building and the distance, the sign will be located off of the roadway, 40, I think 44 at one end and 42 at the other feet. The sign of 50 square feet will be appropriate for passing traffic. The sign will not impair the supply of air or light to adjacent properties. Circumstances related to this property, the size of the lot, the number of lanes in the roadway, and the slope of the ground between the roadway and the building create situations which make this request unique to this property and do not confer special privilege. We are asking for a variance based on specific existing site conditions and the specific use of this property. Thank you. Has anyone questions? I had one uh, on your picture here. Uh, are the red lines to scale? You think the, with yes. Okay. Those little, they yeah, have those tiny little red lines. Are the actual size of the sign? All right. <clears throat> you have uh, a variance to put a sign up before. You have a sign up now. No. You know, you were given permission to put up. We were sign. given a permit to put one up at one end of the property. So there's no signs up on the property. There's none up there now. No, I noticed there's a big paper thing up at, on the wall. Up the at, front at with, with or at the DHI has put right. a wall sign on. Right. But not find their location. That's for one of the occupants of the building. That's one of the yeah. tenants. Right. Any other questions? May have some more later, but. Pardon? I guess that's I guess there are no further questions okay. at this time. Thank you. Um, is there anyone present who would like to speak in favor of this variance? Is there anyone present who would like to speak in general comment or in opposition? Joan Kurnansky, 56 Mound Street. I, I was listening to this conversation, and um, though I was out there lately, I didn't look closely at the site. But I just remember the CVS conversation in front of this board, and the CVS requesting um, additional variances for uh, a larger <coughs> sign, and the board refused them. And I think part of the idea of to maintain some integrity on State Street is to uh, keep within our sign limitations so we're not looking at a lot of signs. Um, and as that area gets more developed, although right now it would seem like just two signs, it may end up being a cluster of signs out there. Um, so I would, I would really like to see the one sign limit applied to this area. Um, and if perhaps the road would get widened to a four lane, then a request for a larger sign or two signs, a uh, hundred square foot sign would be more appropriate. Um, whereas right now with the three lane, it's only 50 square feet. So I would like the board to consider uh, not granting this variance. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else wanting to speak against the variance? If not, Mr. Valentour, would you like to have your pick up your option for a last to have the final word?
Thank you. I just uh, would like to, I think, for the, uh, the record say that for the safety of this property, I think that it would be best if you've ever driven by there and tried to turn off onto the McBee site, it is difficult to see and to turn at the, uh, the two entrances into that property without providing some kind of guidance. It's going to, even if you know where you're supposed to turn, and I've been doing that for some time now, I it will be difficult to I make that turn. That because in my future, my <coughs> previous life, I did have occasion to go out there on a fairly regular basis and did find that locating the drive down over the side there wasn't impossible, but um, I knew where I was going and it wasn't after after my first visit. But um, yes, it is more difficult to see. And, those, it, yeah, and I should note too that these signs will not be very tall at all. They probably will not even extend above the level of the road by very much. The sign is four feet by 14 feet, I think. Mm -hmm. With the concrete base, which again on the sloping ground goes from probably three feet or two feet to five feet at the most. So at nine feet at the low end, 40 feet off the road, which is already tapering off of the East State Street, these signs will not really become a visual nuisance, I don't think, to public access or driving on East State Street. It will be more of a benefit to people that are looking for 1055 East State Street to identify where they need to turn. So you're saying it's only going to be four foot high? The sign itself is four feet tall. And how about its pedestal it's on? It, well, it varies. I think in size and, and the, the, the floor plan or the plan that you have there uh, indicates, I believe, the slope that would be. Uh, okay. Um, so at one point it will be higher than. It would be higher on the downhill side than the uphill side. Accommodating the slope. You had a variance to put one sign up. How come you didn't put the one sign up? We didn't get a variance. Uh, no, we have a permit. Had a, he just had a first sign. Permit. This hasn't been done yet. Permit for the first sign. The, but. But that was allowed without coming to us. The way right. I so why, understand, why didn't you put the sign up yet? Because it would be in the middle of the property the and not near well, the. Well, we have to. We. We. we I don't, I'm not sure what exactly what the owners will intend to do. East State Street, coming out uh, or going from the the west side, would be the more heavily trafficked side coming from Athens, going into the property. So, if the variance is not granted, we might have to reconsider how to uh, to deal with. Access from Why didn't you the, get the east. first sign up? We, we just got the permit just recently. Okay. And, okay. Never mind. Anything else? Or anyone else? Done, done, done. Okay, thank you. And in that case, then uh, further comments from the floor? Are One ready? comment, please. Oh, okay. um, the face area of a sign is measured by a geometric form that encloses the letters. Mm -hmm. So, if you know. Not that anybody's building a monster cabinet with a small sign to try to circumvent the regulations. The measurement standard is measured around the letters itself. Okay. So that's why you see, I think um, there was a reference to the CVS case, for example, and I think I had mentioned at that time that if you took the whole structure that holds the sign up into consideration, there are two 12-inch um, steel columns that hold the CVS sign up, for example. So there's two of them, one foot wide each and 40 feet tall. That would be 80 square feet right there, if the 100 allowed. So would you only be allowed to have a 20 square foot sign on top of two 40 foot wide poles? So the measurement standard is around the letters. So just to kind of clear up the discrepancy between 50 feet or 56 or, you know, how high is the base or how big is, how wide is the frame? Thank you. Does anybody have any questions about that? Then I think we're ready to close comments from the floor and consider our motion for a variance. I move we consider granting a variance in case number 08-04V, zone M. 1055 East State Street, John Ballantor, East State Street Development Company, LLC, appellant. From oh, the rest of the, keep going. <laughs> oh, appellant is requesting a variance from 
23.03-13I4 D to permit a second freestanding sign on a premise where one freestanding sign is the permitted maximum. Do we have a second? Um, not yet. Let's insert how large the sign is to be. Okay. Uh, can you, approximately 50 square feet. Can you make it 56 to be exact so there would be no discrepancy? <laughs> the sign <laughs> to be a maximum of 50 square feet. 56. 56. 56 square feet. Okay. All right. Now can we have a second? Second. Okay, good. All right. What is the practical difficulty or undue hardship um, well, faced? I keep insisting that, that we don't always address this first issue properly. Okay. The see. issue is, what is the hardship that would be created by the board that is not necessary to the fulfillment of public purposes if we say okay. no to the variance. So, so I see hardship? the hardship as um, it would create a, a difficulty in identifying the entries, which would create perhaps a safety problem. And further, I think, something that Mr. Valentour did not allude to, I think that Athens is very uh, pleased to have this might be plant turned into a technology site that promises to be a very valuable entity for the city of Athens. And consequently, I think having such a site that is very difficult to identify would be certainly a hardship maybe for the town and certainly for the business. I see that as the hardship. Oh, I think that's the hardship he was descri describing, yes. Well then, what would be the exceptional circumstances applying to this property that doesn't in general apply to properties in the same zone. It slopes industry. away from the road. And yeah. the three-lane in that area is just three-lane. where lane. it closes yeah. down and then opens back out yeah. again. Yeah, were, the, were there an additional lane, then he wouldn't have to be no, here. Right. Okay. Uh, how about property rights? Would a literal interpretation of the code deprive the appellant of rights commonly enjoyed by others in the same vicinity? Is there anyone else in the same vicinity? <laughs> no. Not in that three lane there. Well, the, the that's the vicinity. Yeah, there's other people there, but they're not, they're not, you know, they, it's not going to be a hardship for them. I, I, I would only say there. there were people living across the street where the light might, but I, don't, I think it's woods across the street. So. Pepsi Rocks right across right. the street. Right. So I All right. Think. Would, uh, is this a minimum variance? I guess it's. Just making two would be fairly minimum. He's not asking for five or six. Well, well he's nor particularly, nor it's minimal for the fact that he's dealing with two entrances. Yes. He's not asking for three signs. No. All right. On number five, would granting this variance um, create a detriment to adjacent properties? No. <clears throat> would it Im materially impair the purposes of the code or the public interest? Mm, yes. The code says one side. Public interest would be safety issues and mm. certainly would enhance the safety of the entrance. I agree. Right. The purposes of the code were to, well, my understanding at the time that the code was being worked, that the sign code was being worked on, were to reduce sign blight. Um, and um, it doesn't seem that the signs as presented being uh, sort of, they look well, like a, very tasteful. They look and, and the wording and is directional, it's not commercial. There's a yeah. big difference, I think. Yeah, this is not an advertising <laughs> sign. You're right, it's an information. Okay, all right then. Um, and, in, and in general, is this variance that's being sought something general or recurring, such the situation would be addressed to city council for changing the law? Pretty unique property. No. Okay, we agreed then. All right, then are we ready to vote? I'll start at this end. Start here. Yeah. I'm going to vote yes. Okay. And? No. Yes. Yes. And yes. So on a vote of four to one, we have a variance. All right. That brings us to our third case for the evening a little different than what we normally do. And um, for
for which we may have a number of people present who want to speak. Um, if there are a number of people who are willing, wanting to speak who have not yet signed in, um, yeah. I would. Um, Thank you. And, and, and well, Steve, we do have somebody in the back who hasn't got the. Ah, thank you. All right, we're going to um, be hearing the case this evening, and it is, if there are a number of people who speak, um, I just wanted to let you know what how we generally handle things is to let people just talk as long as they care to. But this evening, if there are going to be a lot of people speaking, we're going to need to follow our rules as they are set up, which is that you please limit your commentary to no more than two minutes. And um, in addition, if someone has already said what you have to say, please um, just let that stand for you or stand up and say, I agree, rather than um, belaboring the issue by saying the same thing over and over again, um, just so that we can all get home this evening at a reasonable hour. Uh, it would be much appreciated by all of your neighbors, I'm sure. All right, then, having said that, Case number 0803 for 11 and 13 West Stimson Avenue is zoned B3, and the applicant is Three Wide Entertainment. And um, in accordance with 230407A12 and 230702C, the board this evening will consider if the requested use is a principally permitted use in the zone, and if it is per permitted principally then we would have to determine the number of uh, spaces, parking spaces required for the use. Um, we don't do this frequently. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's the first time since I've been on the board. Um, but we're going to, this evening, handle it as best we can. So, um, Steve, could you um, please read it for, the, for everyone present <coughs> the reason that we have to be hearing this this evening. <clears throat> um, this application was received um, back in December, and there was great um, coverage of it, let's say, um, to know what the activity was going to be um, that was proposed. The application said that um, there would be dancing and entertainment um, without the sale without the sale of alcohol. In other words, not a liquor license or sale of alcohol. And um, 120 fixed seats. So, to give an indication of the use as compared to something in the code. For example, dancing and entertainment um, is included in the code um, without definition of what those are. Um, And I'm not sure if that is exactly the type of dancing entertainment um, you know, anyway, that was you, that you, was. I just for yeah, the right you were intended. unable to uh, determine whether or not it was um, stated in the code specifically enough to right. be able to give a permit. So right. this particular use board. is not specifically described as something that's principally permitted or specifically prohibited. Um, if that were the case, um, you'd have to list every possible type of business use, and the, the zoning code would have to be brought in you know, by a forklift. So I think that's why, in the framing of the ordinance, um, there was this allowance for the board to look at things that are just not traditional. Um, and I think the section, if I could read that, the section that you referenced is under um, this particular zone, B3, it's listed as number 12 under principally permitted uses. Um, and it does say, as a principally permitted use, other uses other than those, excuse me, any other use which is determined by the Board of Zoning Appeals to be of the same general character as the above permitted uses, um, but not including any use which is uh, first permitted in an M zone or which is prohibited in an M zone. So it's neither one of those. It's not an, an M zone situation. Um, entertainment, nightclubs, um, theaters, 
pool halls, those kinds of things are actually permitted first in the downtown zone, which is a more restrictive zone than this one. Um, and let me see. eating and drinking places, um, they're actually first permitted um, in the B1 zone so long as they serve residents of the neighborhood. So let me see if there was one other one. Um, another related situation to this is the determination of the number of parking spaces. Um, under powers of the board, original jurisdiction, section 230702C says that in the case of a building structure or premise, the use of which is not specifically mentioned um, in 23, it's actually 2311, table B, off street parking requirements, the board shall determine the amount of parking required. In making this determination, the board shall identify a use from table B, which is similar or comparable in regard to the parking requirement, shall apply those minimum requirements. So, for example, <clears throat> so is this uh, requirement, uh, he's coming in under dance hall, church, restaurant, what? So that's what we have to figure out. Right, the application was for dancing and entertainment. Now, in off street park requirements, there is a section um, called dance halls. There is also a section called assembly halls. Those are the two that I can see that might most so closely. Assembly halls have permanent seating, and dance hall has. There are actually dance halls and assembly halls without fixed seats. There's one parking requirement. That's one for every 100 square feet of floor area. If you, this other section doesn't say with fixed seats, um, but I would have to make the assumption that it was, since it specifically talks about. Um, without fixed seats in the other section. It mentions assembly halls and then one for every six seats. There's really I mean, picking so, things off of the off street parking requirements list of things specifically. So the off street permitted. parking requirements so it would be roughly what? 20, 20, 30 20. seat uh, thirty parking spaces? One one for six fixed seats would be twenty parking spaces required. So 120 spaces divided by six. 20 parking spaces required, if that was the standard. If he's going in as a dance hall? Um, assembly hall. Assembly hall. Yeah. There is nothing that talks about dance halls with fixed seats. No, Steve, dance I hall know couldn't in the, have fixed seats. Uh, yeah, I know in the past, I guess for a fact, I knew dance that hall, there was either one fixes. or two restaurants that have they have. did not have a license for serving alcohol but they would allow the customers to bring their own uh, alcohol and, and use it. Could this be possibly a case that, you know, I mean, they allow the, can they possibly allow the customers to bring uh, alcoholic beverage That's to serve? Yeah. I'm not familiar enough with uh, liquor control laws or specific things that are, that do occur to be able to make a good response. That would be concern, I suppose. No. I think it Well, it does, yeah. No. Ultimately, it, it, let's wait. Okay. Specific we can we can have our discussion down. after we've had our presentation, I guess, from the right. from the. Um, now I can applicant. say that the zoning code says that eating and drinking places um, are not permitted within 200 feet of an R1 or R2 zone. How far is this from an R1 or R2? Zone? Um, approximately 120 feet. But are there, aren't there other eating establishments down there that we've wavered? Not there. to my knowledge. Well, um, there is um, under the B3 designations, uh, number three, which you've alluded to, which is eating and drinking, 200 feet from R1 and R2 zones. And number six talks about commercial entertainment. And I'm not exactly sure what that means, except it suggests it's entertainment for which you are making a profit and people would pay to see, do, be a part of, and that has to be 200 feet from any R zone. Uh, Betty, that's just uh, commercial recreation. Not it's recreation. And, well, commercial no, recreation. Okay. recreation. So what do we not call, entertainment. Okay, what do we call commercial recreation? I would say that's 
could be a variety of like maybe a sports activity or uh, <coughs> the things that are not the <coughs> subject that necessarily <coughs> not be entertained. Let's, let's hold off on this until we close the discussion. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, uh, Steve, we'll probably have other questions for you. But, um, and just as you alluded to, too, this is a little different situation than we've ever seen before. Mm -hmm. Um, you mentioned this is the first time, so is that's why I felt more comfortable yeah. referring this to the board to make the determination because there's nothing really in there to. Yeah. Well, this is one of the things that the board this. is um, assigned to do is to determine exactly this sort of thing, um, where it is not indicated in the code specifically what is a p permitted in this particular area, um, trying to determine what is appropriate for the community and that fits with the intentions of the code. So well, I disagree. I think that should have been city council. Well, no, it says in the, it, well, I'm, I have to find the place in the code where it says exactly that, but um, it does say that this is, Steve, this I have is one, more our, question one of our from your principal comments. Mm -hmm. directives. You mentioned something about a more restrictive zone. Right. Wait, and I assume you were talking about the uptown area? Yeah, the B2D district. And so why would that it, more restrictive in what way? What when you say more restrictive? The uses um, <laughs> permitted are fewer. Um, the uses for example, permitted are fewer. Right. There are more uses permitted in the B3 than there are in the B2D. Got it. But so one of those good. things that is permitted in the decide. B2D is entertainment, <clears throat> which it says it says entertainment. Of course, there's no definition. Nightclubs, theaters, billiard parlors, pool halls, bowling alleys, and similar enterprises. And then there's the 100, 100 foot separation. So that's why, in particular, I did see this in comparing the 100 foot separation for entertainment that carries over to the B3. I did, you know, actually for this application, and I'm sorry if you didn't receive this pack of information um, in the mail. Um, but just for that, because entertainment must be, even in the B2D zone, um, 100 feet away, I measured out 100 feet from the property, and it doesn't touch. In this case, I believe the ordinance says, um, let me see, I don't know if it says any residential zone. What I had to do then was get a copy of the rezoning of Landmark because it went from M to R3. Correct. And because this 100-foot radius can't touch um, any residential zone, where the drinking part has to be 200 feet from an R1 or R2, I did draw, you know, make a determination that this property is a little greater than 100 feet away from any residential zone. When Ms. Hollow had mentioned how close is it to the R1 zone. That's on the north side. It's R3 south, R1 north. And it's approximately 120 feet to the R1 zone. You're, you're talking the back side of those properties is 120 feet. To the zone line, right. Yeah. The, the south property line of the R1 houses that are on. Um, Morris. Um, well, yeah. So, well, no, this is more Montrose and Ondas. Oh, mm -hmm. Yes, those side streets. Yeah. Right. So it's not any of the rear yards of uh, Montrose and Ondas rear yards, not Morris rear yards. And you're not, and you're saying it's 120 feet to the new landmark development. No, it's less than 100 feet. The distance is greater. Yes, the 100 foot radius doesn't touch the landmark property. I mean, I can, you can, if you don't have this, there should be one in the file. And again, I apologize if the, the package that you got didn't contain it. I can show you this, though, if that's what you'd like to see. I have a copy in here. Thank you, Steve. So the prohibition for um, anything closer than 100 feet to any residential zone is not violated if the use considered is entertainment. The bowling alley is back here. The bowling alley is a grandfathered nonconforming use. You know, I, as I read it off, remember it did specifically say bowling alley can't be within 100 feet of a, mm -hmm. 
or a pool hall. Uh, this building used to contain um, sticks and stones. Mm -hmm. Pool hall, so. Uh, Steve, the pool hall was okay, and the bowling alley's not, according to what exists, the language that exists right now. On the application form, they have checked off the sign. As be, aside from the size, is there any restriction on the content of what it could be on the sign, or it could be anything? Aside from the size and height and those other things. No. Um, sign ordinances generally need to be content neutral, um, as long as it's not anything that's offensive. Okay. Um, you know, it really doesn't. It just talks about um, the size of the sign. There used to be a prohibition against telephone numbers on a sign for right. some reason. Um, when the code was changed in, I think, 2004, um, telephone numbers were allowed to be put back on signs. I have no idea why they were prohibited, but you know, before, but they're not now. And so, is, is there anything in the zoning code that regulates what the content of a sign face is? No, no, there isn't. Just the area that it covers. Okay. Um, I think we're ready to hear from the appellant right now. <clears throat> and could you state, please affirm that you've previously been sworn and your, your name and address for the record? I have been previously sworn. My name is Scott Mergenthaler. I am uh, counsel for the applicant in this case. Um, my address is 366 East Broad Street in Columbus, Ohio. Um, Thank you. The original, I wanted to address a couple things, but first I wanted to uh, thank the board for granting a continuance of this from last month. Uh, due to some circumstances beyond my control, I asked for that and I appreciate that. Um, the uh, individual applicant is uh, a business-to-be named Three Wide Entertainment. It's actually a business name of a Mr. Christopher Stotts. He asked me to express his um, apologies for not being able to be here tonight, either due to his work um, schedule. Um, this use, uh, we, we applied for a use as a club and assembly hall, and uh, the description was dancing and entertainment. What um, Mr. Stotts plans to do at this location is to have an adult entertainment establishment, and uh, that is defined in the code. Um, there will be um, exotic dancing that will take place uh, inside this establishment. There will be no sale of any alcohol or food for that matter. Um, there may be, um, there uh, would be anticipated that they would have uh, the ability to bring in their own uh, beverages. Um, the actual uh, floor plan is 9,000 square foot. Um, however, only 4,800 square foot of that is going to be used for the public. So. Uh, there will be 120, up to 120 fixed seats in this um, uh, use. Um, the remaining 4,200 square feet or something will be taken up by uh, dressing rooms, uh, office um, staff rooms, and um, they are also uh, their stage is going to be constructed so that there will be a six-foot dead zone around. Uh, the state law prohibits contact with um, uh, exotic dancers within a six-foot radius, so there'll be a stage and then on a six-foot no-contact zone around that stage uh, that we're um, submitting to the board would not be uh, available for public access or public use. Um, it seems when I look at Athens Code, I know that as of December 17, 2007, there was nothing in the zoning code that would prohibit the use of uh, adult entertainment establishments. Uh, the rumor is, as I understand, I have not been able to verify it, that perhaps there is some legislation enacted since that date. Uh, however, I'm, uh, uh, I'm my, my opinion, based upon uh, what I believe to be the law, is that um, that legislation would not affect the board's decision on, um, on this particular application. Um, when I read this code, I see uh, a number of um, definitions that are not, or a bunch of words that in this code that are not defined. Um, and so I'd like to sort of address those with you. Um, as far as an assembly hall goes, you know, we have a lot of definitions in the Athens Code, but this one's not one of them. 
Um, so I just resorted to the dictionary. And um, an assembly is a group of, a company of persons gathered for entertainment. And that's exactly what we're offering uh, in this use. Uh, and a hall is just a large room for an assembly. So uh, it seems like um, the use qualifies as an assembly hall. And uh, as Mr. Pearson's already indicated, uh, with 120 fixed seats in there, um, we would need 20 parking spaces, and I think there's uh, more than double that amount available for uh, this use. Um, we've also asked for a club status. Um, I think proposed use was deemed a private club, um, and we could um, actually make membership uh, a condition of entry into the club, um, and we would be uh, willing to do that if that um, you know fits the board's needs. Um, but club is defined in the uh, in the code section. Um, let's see if I can grab that for you. Well, I think they just define the word club, uh, a building or portion thereof owned or operated by a person for social, literary, political, educational, or recreational purposes uh, for the use of its members. Um, The issue, I think, in this, or I guess what I would ask the board to do in deciding this case is to remain content neutral. Uh, because these, uh, the issue of whether or not uh, expressive dancing or exotic dancing that's going to be occurring in this is a, uh, it's an activity that's been long protected by the First Amendment uh, of the United States and Ohio's Constitution. And uh, to base a decision uh, on this permitted use on the content of uh, what's occurring in there, uh, I believe would be a violation of this um, um, tenants and, uh, and the owner's uh, rights and guaranteed under the First Amendment. Also, there appears to be some difficulty in my estimation too with um, uh, some due process guarantees that are also uh, required by our Constitution. And in that fact is that the terminology that uh, is used uh, currently in the Athens Zoning Code is vague and ambiguous. And um, I think that the board can, um, should be mindful of uh, guaranteeing the due process rights of this user um, and not just arbitrarily assign uh, definitions that would uh, prohibit this uh, use based solely on uh, content regulation. Um, uh, even if this were deemed to be a nightclub, there still would appear to be, um, you know, enough parking spaces for, you know, if you if you do the square footage uh, computation. Is there any questions that I can answer? Yes, yeah, my question is with respect to, again, the parking spaces. Uh, the nature of this program that you have in there, is it like a fixed amount of time uh, people will be there and then they all leave and a new group comes in, or is it ongoing process, you know, because that changes the parking space, parking... Uh, I believe it would be an ongoing process. Ongoing? It, you, yeah, I, I'm not um, aware of any plans to uh, have a 7 o'clock show and an 8 o'clock show. Okay. Like all right. It strikes me as a bit unusual to have fixed seats in something that might be somewhat similar to a nightclub with people bringing their own bottles, sitting around talking, and you have a chair that you can't move, as I do tonight. Well, actually, I can move my chair. Mm -hmm. um, so, so an assembly hall where people would be expected to sit in their places without moving, as in a church or a a courthouse or a place like that, fixed seats seem reasonable. This seems quite odd to me to talk about fixed seats in a situation with dancing and drinking. And well, um, the patrons are not going to be dancing. I understand so that. So the customers are not going to be dancing. I quite understand yeah. that. And um, but it's still odd. If you went to a club, you wouldn't expect to be in a situation like in a schoolroom where your desk was clamped to the floor, would you? Well, just, I think the purpose, just, yeah. Just, just in passing, just uh, an oddity. 
of the application, um, it seems to me. And does I, I think there's a couple of reasons for that. Yeah. One of which is, you know, that there are uh, specific state statutes that have been recently enacted about, um, you know, the distance that you can maintain from um, um, an entertainer and a right. patron. And so the, the process of putting in the fixed seating sort of protects um, the owner uh, that, you know, we we're hoping that that will protect. Protects the owner in what way? Buffer How does this protect the owner? Well, so we don't have seats up into our dead zone and into the areas where there could be touching or uh, where they could violate that six foot zone. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're saying fixed seating like a movie theater? Right. Fixed seating? Um, or, I it mean, it would be more um, like booths. Booths. Yeah, that, that's what's uh, planned. Okay. You also mentioned that uh, people can bring their own drinks, perhaps. Uh, is that includes like alcoholic beverages? That's what they would like to do, yes, sir. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? <laughs> Maybe not at the moment. Uh, right, we you. probably will have more later. I'm just thank trying to much. count the number of letters. I don't know how many. There must be 50 letters here. Maybe Steve can answer that. <laughs> okay. Um, <coughs> is there anyone present who would like to speak in favor of this application? Or in general comment? Steve? Clarification on the parking. I'm sorry that I didn't add that my original comments. There are approximately 52 parking spaces there now. Um, there is the possibility of adding about four more if the awnings taken off the front of the building. Okay. So, but let's just say we're in the, in the range of about 50. There's a parking lot across the street from the, or there's a lot with this property across the street from the pharmacy. Um, it's 60 feet wide, which is a sufficient width to have double loaded, what they call double loaded parking. What does that mean? Pardon me? Can you explain that? It's double loaded parking. It's called double loaded parking where you have entrance, exit, and then cars park perpendicular. So you got I a see. 20 foot stall, two 10 foot passing lanes, and another 20 foot stall. So that's pretty much the way it's set up now? Yes. Okay. Um, of that area that I just alluded to, there is signage there that says six of the parking spaces are reserved for the pharmacy. So there's six off the let's just work with 50 let's say okay. and so we're uh, talking about parking around back where because is that where there would be more parking around the back of the building right if you remember when um new to you was there they had a drop off door at the back correct and you could um drive around the side of the building and there was kind of like angled parking right there mm -hmm. um given a nine foot stall width minimum there are about 17 parking spaces then that could go along beside the building all the way back toward the roller bowl. And then there's some parking in front of the building. And then there would, there's enough room in the back because the lift was taken out from when the auto repair place was there that used to block off being able to maneuver right there. Um, there's area back there for more parking. Okay, so you're saying that these, what, 50 spaces would all be used for the assembly hall nightclub well right now four spaces are needed for the uh it's i think it's an auto customizing place right now um the code talks about <clears throat> um automobile or machinery sales and service garages one for every 800 square feet so the area that they occupy requires about four parking spaces there's also been a permit approved to use the front part of the building right up at the corner um, for a car sales facility. Um, it would fall under the same category, um, automobile sales, and it would require, I can't remember exactly, but it's three or four. Let's just use the high end. Four in the back, four for the auto dealership that's in the corner, and then I don't know what to do with no. I'm just pointing out okay, so that it's signed for six then of additional spaces to be used at the pharmacy. Okay, so we're down to about 42 spaces then. Right? Six, 12, four, uh, no, 14, uh, and the 40, 46. The spaces on um, no. Palmer Street, would those be redesigned or, because do they meet code? Don't they, 
come the parking on Palmer Street is public parking, can't be counted toward the use, and is not oh, okay. included in All my, right. my okay. total count. All right. Okay. Okay. Um, is there at this time anybody present who'd like to speak in favor of um, this business moving in? Is there anyone present who would like to speak against it? Um, all right. If you would like to, would you like, if you would come to the podium, please, and, um, hmm? Yes, I, I don't think she has, so we will have to do that. Um, Ma'am, I believe you may have arrived after we had already done okay, the swearing so in. Somebody else no, 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 been please. Here to speak before me. No, no swear in. You're, okay. you're, you're welcome to speak. It's just that I need, I think you weren't sworn in, so I need to swear you in. Okay. Uh, do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help me God. Oh, and would you state your name and address for the record, please? Francine Charles, 25 Elliott Street. Thank you. You said. No more than two minutes. Oh, please. <laughs> okay. I would first of all like to start by asking a question. Is this a back door entrance to the strip club? Uh, I think it is a strip club. I think he's That's been the pretty objective. clear. It's a strip club. Okay. Exotic dancing. Strip I, mean, club. I, think, I, I think that's what an exotic okay. dancing that's is. What, it's a strip that, okay, club. that's what okay. I mean, a strip club. All right, so, Pardon me. okay. Um, I guess the first thing I would like to say is that uh, um, this seems to be problematic. Um, Could you adjust the mic? Yes. Okay. I can't hardly see what I've written down. Uh, uh, I think this will bring a bad element to the community. It is within a close proximity of where I live, and I know some people who are much older than me that lives within a block of where this is going to be. Uh, I think it's uh, too close to the schools. Um, and um, I think that it will bring a bad element, and I do not believe we have enough police uh, force. Uh, our police force is not adequate enough to uh, perhaps uh, handle what is likely to follow uh, a club such as this. So I vehemently oppose such a club in this particular location. Now, if they want to take it outside of the city someplace, that's their business. But in this proximity, it's, it's close to uh, there's a, there's a bank there. There are uh, uh, other businesses uh, there, and, uh, and and thinking about the uh, the new uh, building that's coming up uh, for students, I think we have enough problems already. And to bring such a club like this to our community will take away what we have been known for uh, as one of the best cities, the best known. Uh, small towns in the United States uh, and uh, the sense of community and camaraderie that we have here and to bring such a club like this to our neighborhood I think would be a discredit to our community and all of its citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to speak this evening? My name is Bick Weissen Reader, Three Hillcrest Drive. I have already sworn. I spend a lot of time at 7 West Stimson Avenue. Hawking Valley Bank is my employer. Um, vehement was the, was the word that uh, Dr. Childs used. I, I would have to reiterate that from our perspective, that the this type of use for that property is totally out of character with what's going on in the rest of the neighborhood been a fair amount of, of money and effort spent by different property owners in the neighborhood to upgrade the property, to make it better, to make it more presentable. Uh, I think earlier, uh, Muriel, you commented on uh, does it, does granting the variance cause detriment to anyone? Well, I can flat promise you that having that across the street from us will cause detriment to our values. So 
I, I, I didn't want to not say anything because I certainly didn't want to leave the impression that uh, that we were indifferent to this. So I, mm -hmm. I really hope you you turn this down. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else who has uh, an opinion to state? Yes, yes. Please. Excuse me, I was sworn earlier. I'm Glenn Matlack. I have a house at 35 Morris Avenue, um, which I share with my family, including two young children. Um, as you, I, we are slightly beyond 100 feet from the, the property in question. We're somewhere around 180, I would guess. But from our back windows, we can easily see, with the leaves off the trees, the property in question. And I've already had to answer questions from my grade school children as to what a strip club is, what do people do there, why are people excited about it, and it is not fun answering those questions. I'm a little surprised at the discussion as to the definition of this under the law. Is this a, an assembly room? Is this a club? Is this an entertainment venue? Um, it seems to me uh, that the definition is quite clear and that when the people who originally formed those codes, whenever they wrote them, would not, were not thinking of a strip club when they, they framed it in those terms. And city code is quite, that recognizes this sort of establishment and is quite explicit about it. Um, in section 1305.11, the Athens city code states, and I quote, no person shall create, direct, or produce an obscene performance when the offender knows that such material is to be used for commercial exploitation or will be publicly presented. I move down the paragraph slightly and I quote, no person shall advertise an obscene performance for presentation or present or participate in presenting an obscene performance when such performance is presented publicly or when admission is charged. So, it's pretty clear, at least to me, that this use um, runs against established city code. There seems to be no ambiguity. This is, um, as the lady pointed out, um, the first example of this in Athens that I know of. There's a real danger of um, creating a precedent here. This is not, in my mind, where we want this city to go. I'd also like to speak to the, the parking issues. Um, as one of you uh, said, it, it occurs to me that the parking on Homer Street is in fact city property. That's a city right-of-way. I'm worried that if we grant uh, the variance to the, the club to use that as parking, that will create a precedent for private businesses using city rights-of-way, which are scattered all over the town, for, um, for parking, which is not something we want to see happening, I think. I'm also aware that the owner of the property has applied to the state for use of this property as a used car lot. Um, I think the, the official category is luxury car lot. I'm not sure what that means. But it's essentially a used car lot. And the vision that I got from reading the paper about this is that there would be one business in one part of the building, the other business in the other part of the building. Now, car lots, by their nature, use a lot of parking. You have to line up the cars in an attractive way. And that parking space would eat into these parking uh, spaces that Mr. Pearson uh, described. I'm very much afraid that the parking demanded by the club would overlap the parking demanded by the used car lot. And in fact, parking would, in a, in a practical sense, spill out into the surrounding neighborhoods. And the surrounding neighborhoods on one side is the student neighborhood toward Mill Street. And on the other side, not very far away, is Morris Avenue, a family neighborhood, many elderly um, citizens, and a school. And um, as the police will tell you, this sort of businesses are accompanied by a high incidence of rowdiness, public drunkenness, and various sorts of crime. And I really don't want that spilling over into my neighborhood. 
In a larger sense, this seems to me to set the tone for the development of Stimson Avenue. Stimson Avenue is a, a turning point. Um, several long-established businesses have folded. Unfortunately, we're looking at redevelopment in the area. When a developer comes, potential developer comes and looks at it, what they want to put there will be determined to some extent by what they see there. If they see carefully thought out commercial development, prospering businesses, restaurants, small shops with, how, with um, lodging, that will direct their minds in one way. If they see vacant lots, a car lot, <coughs> a strip club, that will direct their minds in another direction. Okay? I don't think we want to go in that other direction. It seems to me that the decision of the Zoning Board of Appeals tonight has the potential to direct development on Stimson one way or the other for a long time into the future. And I would strongly encourage you to vote against this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, who else would like to speak this evening? Is there, a, is there somebody else who would like to speak? <coughs> I'm Debbie Phillips. I live at 48 Hudson Avenue. I'm a member of Athens City Council. Um, you all know that we have been considering and are working through the process um, to amend some ordinances relating to businesses of this nature. Obviously, those would affect to any um, future proposals and not one that is currently under consideration. But one of the things that I think is relevant is um, in that process, we've been made aware of a lot of the information about the secondary effects of this type of activity. And while um, the activity is constitutionally protected and your, your decision can't really be based on the content of that activity, I think it's perfectly legitimate to consider the secondary effects. Um, one of the examples that was provided to us was a newspaper article about um, a shooting at a similar facility in Columbus where two people were killed in 2006. And that was a facility that was a bring your, bring your own beverage um, kind of operation. So there, there is documentation of, of negative secondary impacts of these kinds of businesses that I think would be legitimate for you to consider. Um, I would also refer as well to the comprehensive plan and the, um, the corridor plan for Stimson Avenue, which many people in the community had an opportunity to weigh in on. Um, that has been approved by the Planning Commission and by City Council. So I think as you're considering the um, the general character of activities allowed in the zone, we have some indication um, to guide us as to what the community expects to see happening there. And I'm aware that some of the property owners along that corridor are very interested in moving forward in you know, working toward that vision for that corridor. So um, you know, in addition to looking at the secondary impacts and the fact that it is close to um, an elementary school in a residential neighborhood, um, that those are things we can be concerned about. We also do have some guidance about what's planned for that area. Um, and I also am aware that the, the property owner has several other options that are, are being considered for this property. Um, there's a, a recent application that's been made, and um, I spoke with him earlier today, and I think that we do have the, the opportunity to you know, move toward a more appropriate use of that, mm -hmm. that property in that zone. Well, and so. it's the, not the property owner who's making this application this evening. It's, an, it's a business that would like to Correct. rent from the property owner. So, Correct. I mean, business could possibly rent from some other property owner someplace else also. Yeah. So um, those are just a couple things that I wanted to mention. Also, as you're looking at the parking requirement, it looked like there were several options um, because this doesn't exactly fit anything in that um, table about the, the parking requirement. Um, if it seems more like the use that requires one space per 100 square feet, then 4,800 square feet of public space would require more than the 40 or so spaces that seem to be available. So I'll just mention that as well. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. Um, is there anyone else this evening who has something to add? If not, I have several letters that I, I we have approximately 50. I, Steve, did you ever count the letters? Do you know how many is in this file? <coughs> 
um, lies, but. When this became fairly well known to the public, I started receiving quite a few emails. Um, I copied each one of those because I believed them to be a public record, yes. informed the people who sent them to me um, that I was going to place it in the record, um, and then a very few actually written letters that came mm -hmm. in. I would say, I don't know, maybe 50 emails and 15 letters, yeah. and phone calls by I can't tell you how many mm -hmm. hours of phone well, calls. Well, we can't get those in the record, and obviously I can't petition. read all of the letters, there's but there's a petition right. here with, um, I think, about 25 names on it. Right. A lot of what you see in the record, too, is also people petitioning me, essentially, to refer this to the board. That's what yes, a lot of those are about, and the majority of them us, are yes. about. They're not, they do then describe their, I would say, their um, point of view right. on the particular use, but most of them start out asking me to, re, you know, to use that section of the code to refer the matter to the board. That's the bulk of them. Um, well, the um, petition that we have here, and um, I, I guesstimated about 50 um, others, but then there's a petition with 24 names on it, um, say, we, the undersigned, have concerns about the com permitting of uh, Stimson Avenue Gentlemen's Club. We feel there are numerous concerns <coughs> that need to be addressed more fully in a public forum. Therefore, we request that Steve refer this permit to the Athens Board of Zoning Appeals, and which he did. Um, and I've selected a sampling of the letters um, from people who wrote them. Um, one is dated recently. Tuesday, January 15, not, this, not so recent. Um, Dear Mr. Pearson, I have grave concerns about the potential gentleman's club that's been proposed for the Stimson Avenue neighborhood. I believe it would make a significant negative statement about our community, particularly in its proximity to East Elementary School, the Senior Citizen Center, as well as the new apartment complex being constructed quite near the proposed site. I have no problem with such an establishment being built in some remote area from city residential communities but I'm dead set against it in the center of town. And this was signed by uh, Richard K. Bracks. Richard K. Bracken. Um, then a, another letter, um, also short so I can read it. Um, I'm very concerned about the strip club being proposed for students in Avenue. This is a family neighborhood with elementary schools close by. In addition, this will ruin the comprehensive plan for the area, which would emphasize family and student retail stores and pedestrian traffic. Such stores will be less inclined to locate next to a strip joint. Please refer this case to the Board of Zoning Appeals. It needs more discussion, more chance for public input. This is June Holly on 8 Lincoln Street. Um, and, and as an example of a longer letter, um, dated a lot of things. Oh, this was an email. January 15. Dear Mr. Pearson, I'm writing because I'm dismayed that the Near East neighborhood apparently is about to be graced with a gentleman's club on Stimson Avenue. I implore you to refer the permit decision to the Board of Zoning Appeals. The public deserves a chance to comment and formally state its complaints on a project that's certain to harm the neighborhood. Personally, my biggest objection is that a strip club has no place in a neighborhood full of young families. I have two young children. I have two children aged four and eight. I'm neither naive nor a prude. But I see no good reason why a strip club needs to be located within a few hundred feet of our home. Every other mom and dad I've spoken to feels the same way. Moreover, the project would be located among residential buildings and appallingly close to East Elementary School. Other cities, Cleveland for instance, regulate the placement of strip clubs by requiring them to be at least 1,000 feet from <coughs> homes, schools, parks, playgrounds, daycares, etc. And she uh, references uh, a place to search about Cleveland. This club will further hurt the neighborhood economically. Existing plans for upgrading Stimson would be strongly undermined. What new business or housing development would choose to be located next to a strip club? I don't know if property values for homeowners would be depressed, and that's not my chief concern, but it does appear to be another possible effect. Other impacts include the potential for increased crime and disorderly conduct in the immediate vicinity of the club. This would put increased demands on our already strained public safety system. There well may be a market for a strip club in Athens, but honestly, there are very good reasons that in other cities that have strip clubs, they're located at the edge of town or at least far from residential areas. This would be a far more appropriate solution for Athens as well. If the developer wants to maintain cordial relations with the community, he would be well advised to look into alternative, less central locations. I ask you to please ensure that Zoning Board of Appeals gets involved in this process. Athens deserves development that will enhance 
the community, the quality of life for all of its residents, not degraded while putting cash into pockets of a few well-heeled individuals. Many thanks for your time and consideration. This was sincerely Patricia Stokes, uh, 67 Morris Avenue, which is very close by. And let's see, I have, there's one other um, of the many, but um, this one is, it has come to my attention that the zoning board is considering the approval of a strip club in my neighborhood. Presently, the east side is a, quaint, is a quiet neighborhood, conducive to raising children, a quality that's always made Athens a wonderful place to live. They have a tremendous responsibility because their decisions shape the type of community we will have in future. I guess referring to the zoning board. A strip club in the middle of a neighborhood. If I'm a person of character looking for a place to move my family, it's not going to be a, to a neighborhood with a strip club. You can say gentleman's club, but a rose is a rose by any other name. I would not want my children to grow up thinking this type of entertainment is family oriented. It's a business that will only appeal to a certain type of individual, not a whole family. They will be responsible for their decision, but once done, it'll be difficult to undo, so they must ask themselves, what will the strip club bring to this neighborhood? How will this strip club advance the neighborhood? How will this strip club benefit the east side? How will this strip club facilitate the raising of children? How will this strip club facilitate the growth of young people into responsible adults? How will this strip club turn away respectable business and respectable people? How little do I care about the people living, living in Athens? Uh, how little do I care about the families living in East Side neighborhood? With this approval, the East Side families are forgotten and the children discarded. With this approval, the quality and safety of the neighborhood is compromised for the good of no one. So in the final analysis, the decision is theirs. Are they going to turn Athens into a trash town, or will they allow Athens to remain a respectable town of higher education? I support this Board of Appeals at using their power to assure the zoning board makes the right decision. Um, this was Sally Heron of 35 Meadow Lane. Um, this one seems a bit content-oriented. I got started, and I didn't um, stop. Um, the ones that, anyway, uh, let's see, did I? Good the sample. one on May Avenue, Tonga Cox. We did a good sample. This was the, good that is a one. representative sample. Some of them you were like that. And, the and I do also have one from the superintendent of schools, uh, which was done, the and next one, one down. From the principal of the East and Elementary. East Elementary. Uh, the, the superintendent and the principal basically said similar things. So as a superintendent of the Athens <coughs> City School District, I'm writing this letter in regards to the above referenced business, the three wide entertainment business that has been issued, that hasn't been issued a permit, I guess he thought it was. An article in the Athens News Monday, January 14, outlined a request for a permit to open a private club of dancing and entertainment in the building. As the representative for the school district, I feel the application for an adults-only gentleman's club on the reference site should be referred to the Board of Zoning Appeals for review and public comment. Please consider the impact this type of business on Stimson Avenue will have on the local community. Um, of the Near East Side. I believe such a business could be a detriment, could be detrimental to the safety and welfare of the children in nearby residential neighborhood and those attending East Elementary School. I also believe this type of business will be harmful to future economic development along Stimson Avenue. Given the many needs of our community and the diminished availability of land and buildings for good economic development, this type of business should not be allowed to occupy such a precious resource. I sincerely hope you will send this uh, matter to the Board of Zoning Appeals in order for the local community uh, to give a voice in the use of their resources. And then I might as well find the one from Dan Boger. Um, as the principal of East Elementary, I'm writing this letter in regard to the three-wide entertainment <coughs> application for zoning certificate O. 72501 9 and 13 East Stimson Avenue. An article in the Athens News Monday, January 14, uh, outlined a request for a permit to open a private club with dancing and entertainment in the building. I feel the application for an adults only gentlemen's club on the above site should be referred to the Board of Zoning Appeals for review and public comment. Please consider detrimental to the safety and welfare of the students and children attending East Elementary harmful to future economic development of Stimson Avenue. Um, and I think now that really very, that is very representative of the other letters which we have received. Um, is there any other commentary from the floor? And Steve, 
from anyone else? You've got a question for me. I'm going to have to talk about some things if I'm going to vote on this. Well, mm -hmm. absolutely. That's the next thing we're going to do, but I just want to make sure that everyone in the public... Do you want to Mr. Morgenthau first before we talk about this? Yeah, okay. as soon as I'm sure that every... I want every... to ask yeah. some people some questions, okay. if I may. Uh, well, I, would Mr. Morgenthau be one of them? Because he gets an opportunity. I would like him to have an opportunity to say something. I just want to get this in before you close the floor. Oh, I'm not closed. I, yeah, I haven't closed anything Good. yet. Okay. Um, Mr. Morgenthau, would you like to um, say anything additional? Yes, thank you. Yeah. I would like to address some of the concerns uh, that were voiced today. Okay. Um, first off is... Um, and I hope I don't get names wrong. I tried to write down as fast as I could Mr. Matlack's concerns um, that this uh, use would somehow violate uh, the criminal code sections that are embodied in um, Athens code. And there was a morals and decency code that outlined certain criminal offenses, one of which would be pandering obscenity. Um, and, and I can assure this board and Mr. Matlack that whatever goes on in that establishment will not meet the definition of obscenity as it's been handed down, you know, from time and time by the courts of the United States and the state of Ohio. Uh, and so we're not, uh, there are going to be no criminal offenses that are going to be violated uh, inside this uh, building. Um, Ms. Phillips, uh, Councilperson Phillips, is correct in when you're enacting legislation such as uh, I believe the city's in the process of doing that would uh, put prior restraint upon uh, this adult entertainment establishments, um, you are an, an able, an able to consider those issues like secondary effects, um, you know, the crime that it may be speculative at best that this use would create. Um, and, um, you know, the, the reports of killing up in Columbus and all that kind of stuff, you are allowed to consider those secondary effects in enacting this ordinance um, and, and in supporting the regulation of this ordinance. But there is no ordinance at this juncture that would regulate this type of behavior. And so I think that it would be improper for the board uh, to uh, base their decision as to whether or not to grant this, this initial use permit um, based upon the speculation that uh, there may be some crime that would be um, increased or, or, you know, because of the use of this property. Um, and so, well, I would just like to reiterate that this is a first time per, uh, request for this use. We're not talking about a variance. Um, we're talking about is this use in conformity with the zoning code as it is enacted in December of 2007. And um, I believe that our point was that if you call it an assembly hall, which it is, if you call it a club, which it is, um, if you call it a um, entertainment, which it certainly is, um, then all those uses can be um, can be at this location. And um, the parking is, um, is more than adequate uh, for any of those assembly hall uses, for the club use, and for the entertaining use. Um, just one other issue, I guess, is that um, I know there is uh, a public outcry about this use. And I'm really not here to um, to say one way or the other that this is a good um, activity that goes on there or a bad activity that goes on there. But take, for instance, um, let's say, pick a religion, a Baptist church, wanted to go into an area that's zoned for church. Okay? Are you going to listen to, uh, you know, a community full of Catholics that doesn't want a Baptist church in their community? I mean, saying that, you know, our religion is the only one. Baptists aren't, um, you know, the particular religion that we want in our community, you would certainly never, never um, deny that application based upon the content of the speech that's going on in that Baptist church and based upon the outcry from the Catholic community that they don't want Baptists in. Now, 
I'm not casting aspersions upon Catholics or Baptists, I'm just using that as an example. But that's clearly what would go on here if this board would deny this permit. It's, it is it is a applicable use under your code. Um, and uh, if you were to uh, abide by the wishes of the residents of Athens that have stood here tonight or sent you letters and emails, uh, then what you're doing is you're regulating uh, this use based solely upon the content of the speech that's happening there. And you, you might want to talk to your law director if you have not already. Uh, he may be in the room tonight, maybe he wants to uh, weigh in on this, uh, but there are certainly constitutional prohibitions that would weigh heavily uh, against such a decision. So we'd like you to consider that in, uh, in granting this application for zoning. Thank you. Um, we all know that we can't consider the um, kind of activity. We're not. We're not regulating. We're not going to be regulating obscenity or anything like that. We are all aware of that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. We're not going to be getting into any protected speech issues here because that's not what we've been asked to do. Um, but do, do we have any kind of guidance that we should be having other than that, that we want to be considering what this... Uh, See, that's what I would like Mr. Lang to provide for me, is why I'm dealing with a request use, uh, uh, whether or not it's principally permitted. Uh, it seems to me my legal department ought to be able to <laughs> mm -hmm. provide me with that information and not put it on my back. Yeah. Yeah. What? Well... I'm sorry, Madam Chair, are you? Uh, please, uh, uh, we're, I am interested in any kind of guidance you can give us as to what we can consider here, um, what kinds of um, uses, I mean, I don't think it, well, anyway, go on. Well, much, much like all of us, I mean, tonight's really the first time that we've had a, a specific, you know, have, having someone come forward with specifics as to what, uh, you know, is being proposed for this use, and so uh, given that fact, I think it's appropriate that, um, you know, it, it would ultimately be, you know, the responsibility of myself and, and my office to represent the city should any legal challenges come uh, as a result of any actions that would be taken by this board or, or by any other city board or, or city council. So I think it's appropriate for me to be somewhat measured in the advice that I, I give here this evening. Uh, that said, it, it would be nice if we had a, a straightforward uh, legal definition of, uh, of exactly uh, what constitutes a, uh, you know, a use that would be, a, you know, in the same general character of a principally permitted use, um, and that's, but that's ultimately, uh, you know, what this board is empowered to decide under the code. Uh, you know, we have 12, uh, you know, delineated specific things that are principally permitted uses for a B3 zone, um, and then we have, uh, you know, this uh, this line which is being you know, evoked here uh, this evening uh, for those things that are not specifically. Uh, put out in the code as, as, as permitted uses that are not uh, specifically prohibited uh, for that. And so, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, as obviously, as, as Madam Chair, as you said, uh, clearly whatever de uh, decision this board should, should make tonight is not going to be based upon, uh, you know, the, uh, you know the, the First Amendment, uh, you know, protected, uh, you know, sorts of, of speech. And it's not going to, uh, uh, to address an issue that was raised earlier about due process. I, I don't necessarily think that we're dealing with a situation that is overly vague. I think that, you know, the language is what it is, which is to say that this board, which is comprised of, of members of the community, is empowered to determine whether what you've heard here tonight, whether this proposal uh, is uh, something that uh, would be considered to be in the same general character of other things that are allowed. And so that's kind of, of where we're at, and that's, uh, that's what the code empowers us uh, to do here tonight. And um, were we to determine that it is similar to something that's in the code, um, would it be something that would be within our jurisdiction to determine that um, in the interest of preserving quality of life for the area, in the interest in um, preserving the health and welfare of children, in the interest of um, re, uh, ensuring the future development of the neighborhood can be pursued as planned, to uh, indicate that this would be a business that was better done in another location than this one. Madam Chair, I, I think we're, we're limited to determining uh, what 
whether or not we, we, within those parameters of a B3 zone. I think that's kind of the, you know, the, the universe that we're dealing with here tonight is given the information that's been presented to this board, do we feel that that is uh, something that is of the same general character of other permitted uses for this zone specifically? Okay, and that's what we have to, so. But they're asking for a permit to uh, engage in dancing and entertainment. So who's to say what the nature of the entertainment is? Us? No, you no, don't even no, tell that. No, we don't determine anything attorney. about the nature he's of the entertainment. He's already told us. asking for dancing and entertainment. He's, asked, he's well, told no, us no, that sir. it's a strip club. Well, well no, again, I, I don't think we've got a, a specific definition. I mean, that's a, a, as uh, Director Pearson said earlier, the reason that it's here before the board tonight is because it doesn't fit neatly into one of those boxes that has been laid out in the code as being allowable for this zone. Uh, but by the same token, there's nothing that comes out and directly says that something like this is not allowed. I think that there are certainly elements of it that you could say, you know, there are there elements of, um, you know, of an assembly hall or elements of a club, but it, it's not a, it's, it's certainly not a, a clear cut issue, which is why it fell under that exception for, uh, you know, principally permitted uses, and that's we, why we're. We have to cut. decide whether a strip club is the same thing as a bingo hall, right? Basically. Or whether it's or a, a, of a, of a or similar bank or character, or post office, or, or the or other kinds of things that are permitted in the neighbor in, in that grocery store. Yeah. Right. I mean, again, just taking taking into account the information that that you've been presented with tonight about the uh, you know what's being proposed for for the use on this site, um, you know, is, is that of the same general character of uh, other things that are are specifically allowed in a B three? Because of the nature of the um, uh, the uh, 120 seats that are fixed in building of 9,000 square feet, is, is that the sort of thing that we're uh, to be comparing with when we try to decide whether this is the same thing as, as a, an yes. assembly hall? I don't think the language of the code gives us any clear direction on that. I think that the, the language, uh, you know, again, it's, it's uh, you know, there's not okay. a straightforward answer to that. Okay. That's okay. why I'm uncomfortable with it. Mr. Lang, so basically we need to define if it's a dance hall, dance or entertainment. And then from there, we can define, decide what is parking. Well, That's the, the parking. boundaries. Yeah, the parking, so the parking is completely, yeah, except right. the is that, is that, so if we say it's a dance hall or a dancing and entertainment, then we have to look at the parking restrictions or the parking requirements. Is that? For, for purposes of, of parking? Yeah. I would for purposes of this whole thing. We have to make a definition of, is this a dance? No, hall? no, I don't think you have to make a definition. I would have to disagree with that. I think again, the question is just: is this of of the, sa of the same uh, general character oh, okay. of, of these other issues? And then once once we've cleared that threshold, then on, on the parking issues, uh, yeah, that would we'll be the second. Once you figure out which uh, thing it's similar to, <coughs> then you decide. Yes. Then you can figure out whether or not has enough parking. The amount of parking that the thing that it's similar to would be required to have, right. would be what it would be required to have. I, I, yeah, I believe that would be, for the parking would be the, the second issue that second. would be the first one. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, so um, our, our job is to see, is this similar in nature, in nature, to, in character and nature to to what's currently in this, and let's in just this let's just go over those similar uh, things that is mentioned. There's 12 items: hospitals, animal shelters, animal clinics, uh, building and printing trades, bottling works, contractors' yard, agricultural uh, farming uh, uh, activities. These are the activities that uh, you can take your family in there. The neighborhood can go in there and have a use, be a benefit to the family. But this is not going to be similar because I don't think anybody in the neighborhood is going to be using, utilizing this facility, and you are not going to take your family in there. So that's where the similarity comes. You know, the type of the businesses we are talking uh, has a benefit to the immediate neighborhood, but I don't think this is going to have any impact on the, uh, as a benefit to the uh, people in the neighborhood. So. When we compare the similarity, those are the type of the uh, items or uh, activities that's mentioned in those 12 items. From the B3 zone? B1. Yeah, B3, yeah. So, but, but, but I want to vote against it. I <coughs> just have to say that uh, this would involve immoral and criminal activities? You can't, or no, 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 no
immoral no, no, or no, criminal. No, no, no. You can't, you can't vote no, based on that at all. Natural. That has yeah. nothing to do with what we're it's it's being office. asked to vote. Well, but, that's what I, I keep well, hearing. Okay. Look, that look at what's what already hearing. there. Look what's in the neighborhood. Let's talk about what's There's there. There's a brand new bank that just opened, what, within the last year. The Hocking Valley Bank has spent a great deal of money upgrading its facilities and expanding them. There's an attorney's office there. There are laundromats and Chinese the post office and a restaurant and a couple of um, grocery stores, the pharmacy and the new market or the There's little market. There's one beer and liquor establishment. Right, and a beer and liquor establishment which does not bring patrons who stay there for any purpose at all except to choose whatever You're beer or wine. You're saying what I just said. Right. We're immoral and criminal activities. No. But buying beer is criminal? No. Well, the back <laughs> it's door not. and the front door, it's no. what you're it's I don't talking know. About. I think you need to look at what is this neighborhood like? And I'm talking only about Simpson Avenue as a general business area. But if you move 20 feet beyond it, you are in fact at a residential area. We're only talking about, as the code exists now, it says you can only be within a hundred feet of a particular. I'm with you 100 percent. Okay, we code doesn't it, deal with that. Yes, it does. In that, we are allowed to consider other uses that are not named here. You could say, well, it's a nightclub, but it's a nightclub with a difference, isn't it? You could say it's a, an assembly hall. I cannot, in my father's imagination, call this an assembly hall because an assembly hall is where people go to discuss issues like who shall we have for our local sheriff? Who wants to well, work for that? I certainly entity. wouldn't be comfortable making those definitions, but apparently. Well, I'm you speaking are. personally. No, no, the definitions are already personally. in there, and okay. that's what we're being asked to do tonight right. is to see if any of those definitions that Apply are in the code place. can be made to apply to the business application that is being presented here. Is this similar in nature and character to what is presently on Stimson Avenue and in the larger area, which is very closely allied to this area, within 20 feet I'm talking about. Now, I'm going to read a couple of things. Uh, one is from uh, um, a document that our former law director, Gary Hunter, gave us on municipal zoning, and on page 13, it refers to the power of the board, and this is somewhat redundant because you already know what your powers are, but <clears throat> it says the right of the individual to use and enjoy his property is not unbridled, but is subject to the legitimate exercise of the local police power, and in this case, that's us, since we are an extension of the local police power which includes the power to impose zoning regulations to further the public safety, health, morals, or general welfare. And I think that is something of what we're talking about, the secondary effects, and, they, and our code does, well, at least this section, which is part of the Ohio Constitution, and Article 13, moral, Number 3, moral, does saying. mention, okay, that's, this is from the Ohio Constitution, Article 13, Number 3, which says that we have the right to address that. And then uh, here is a further um, rather lengthy and detailed statement from this same article. It's on, in my copy, it's on page 36, and it's titled The Discretion of the Board. I hate to bore you with too much of this. Um, and it's talking about variances specifically, and we're not being asked to grant a variance, but the effect would be the same, uh, essentially, because it would give this property owner the right to use this property uh, for a particular use. In this case, the Exotic Dancing Club. It says, the determination of the question whether a variance should be granted is a matter within the sound and wide discretion of the Board of Zoning Appeals. And this refers to Menta Lagoons, Inc. versus Zoning Board of Appeals, et cetera, et cetera, a particular case. In the absence of proof to the contrary, the Board's decision in relation to a variance application will be presumed valid and reasonable. Again, a case is cited. This is Diebel versus Wilson. Um, it will be nullified by a court only when the decision constitutes an abuse of the board's discretion. Again, a case is cited, Neethamera versus Hire. Again, a case where it might be uh, 
put aside, a use of power in excess of that granted to the board, again another case is cited, or an unreasonable ruling under all circumstances. Then it goes on to say, <coughs> As zoning regulations impose a variety of requirements upon the granting of a variance, the factors upon which a Board of Appeals may consider in relation to a variance application may not always be the same. However, the ordinances and enabling acts are sufficiently standard to permit some generalizations of these factors. And here's the point I want to make. It is clear that the Board must, in the usual case, examine the unique circumstances of the applicant the character of the neighborhood where the proposed use will be situated, the effect of the variant use on other property, the probable effect of proposed use on the area where it will be maintained, and the general effect upon health, safety, morals, and welfare of the community. See Spencer versus Board of Zoning Appeals, etc., etc., etc. In determining whether a variance should be granted, in this case a use rather than a variance, the Board may consider the nuisance potential inherent in a particular use in relation to its surroundings, and a denial of the variance is not unreasonable when fairly prompted by such considerations. So it seems to me that we do have the right to consider some secondary effects, even with the, um, the code that we have currently currently in place, rather than simply speculating on what may be in an ordinance later on. That's all I want to say about that. Okay. Um, does anybody have any additional <coughs> questions for... Hmm. Go on. <coughs> oh, I guess we've had our questioning. Yeah, we did. Um, do we understand then that what we're what we're what, what's at issue right now um, is whether or not this adults only club can be compared to some where it's not in the code that it's permitted, but it's not in the code that it's not permitted in you know as in that description whether or not it is a principally permitted use in B3 because it's like something that has been shown to be principally permitted I use. hope I just said that it wasn't. It just, yeah. I think you did, but I'm, I just want to make sure that... <laughs> yeah, yeah okay. that's right. We have some... That's, that's what we're considering here. It's not a bank. It's not a grocery store. It's not a post office. It's not a lawyer's yeah. office. It's not, it's not even a nightclub, per se. Well, it isn't, uh, as far as I can tell. A nightclub is some place where you... This will be a club that meets at night, but it has a special, unique yeah. element that does have an effect, uh, I think, on the economic development of the okay. area and the character of the neighborhood. And all of the, th the um, uses that you've described, you've listed, are permitted uses. Um, is this like that? So, do we have any further discussion that we need to that we want to make? Make a motion. Motion. Um, and they go after that, huh? Yeah. Um, um, I move the board. I move that the board, in case of 0803, in regard to the property at 11 and 13 West Stimson Avenue, represented by a tree white entertainment, to consider whether or not. The requested use is principally permitted in this B3 zone in accordance with sections 230407A and 230702C with request for 42 parking spaces. Well, shouldn't the parking spaces be something that is considered separately if yes. we determine yes. that this yes. is, yeah. yeah, it would be... If, if we if say it's, it's okay, then we can consider If it is a okay. principally permitted use, then the number of spaces will be of interest, but if it's not, then it just doesn't apply. So just uh, delete with a request for 42 parking spaces. Right. Okay. okay, does anybody want... Does that sound good? Mm -hmm. Somebody that. second it? Right. Seconded. And I would like to, um, before I say anything else, <laughs> to say this. Um, it's been pointed out that um, this is not the only location in Athens that might be um, mm -hmm. considered for such a club, so we're not saying that there can be no such thing, because that's not our right to say. And we should also remember that uh, the owner of this property, who is not the appellant tonight, 
has in fact already submitted architect's plan mm -hmm. for a different use and that plan has been passed on to the Planning Commission by um, Mr. Pearson, mm -hmm. and they have already set a date to talk with Mr. Prokos that about yeah. that plan on that shouldn't have anything to do with our decisions tonight about the use of the place. Well, I think it does. Well, I you think make I your opinion. I'll have mine. Yeah, I, I think yes, um, I will. it's information that's interesting. Um, you know, and you, you never want to restrict a person's use of his property unreasonably. Yeah. It's not somewhere else. It's, the same it's right property. here. It's his property. There, there, are, there are other uses. I think this number property. 12 really says any use determined by the BZA to be of the same general character. That's very clear that we so. need to look at this. This is, this is not right. the same general character as all those items mentioned in the first 12 items. So right. that's yeah. basically. What, what bothers me as much as anything is that when I got on this board, I was under the impression I was going to be dealing with variances. Well, well we not have the other thing things to consider. All of a sudden, I find I'm we not dealing do, with the variances. We do use no. permits. We do conditional uses. We do well, reviews. Interpretation. But, but that's not the only thing. That's not the only thing that we're required to do. That's what was one of the things in the in the opening statements that we read every every time. It lists the other things that we are in. Like, we are lost occasionally asked to review something that the. Um, code Can't executive has passed on to us, or even to interpret whether he's made a decision that yeah. is fair and equitable. The board is also empowered to hear and decide applications for conditional use, substitutions for non-conforming use, temporary uses, appeals where it's alleged the appellant there is an error in the decision made by the uh, zoning administrator, and requests for interpretation of the code, which is what we're doing tonight, is interpreting it. Mm -hmm. So. So let's go on. Okay, so, so many. it's been moved and it's been seconded. And is there any further discussion before we decide to vote? We always continue to come back to exactly what you keep saying, Mr. Bolton, which is the, what is in the area, what's the other development, what are the other businesses. Yep. Okay, well. So, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, can I just uh, please clarify what exactly the motion that's uh, on the table right now is? Uh, the motion is to grant um, to to the request. Do you want me to read it? Oh, yeah, would you? I move that the, the board, in case of 0803, in regard to the property at 11 and 13 West Simpson Avenue, represented by Three White Entertainment, to consider whether or not the requested use is principally permitted in this D3 zone in accordance with sections 230407A and 230702C. We're moving for approval. We always move in the affirmative. Yeah. That doesn't necessarily imply anything. Actually, I said whether or not, so we are not sitting When I read mine, I, I, my remark was that we would consider granting. Yes. And I feel very comfortable with consider <laughs> rather than recommend. I just wanted to make sure we were all on the same page. Yeah. Are we? And it was seconded. Okay. And discussed. And I think we're ready to uh, uh, vote. Roger, would you like to vote first? No. Okay. John? No. No. You, oh, you're not? No. And I also vote no. It doesn't seem to fit um, any of the requirements. So then we have one other thing we have to do this evening. Um, determine whether or not, has everyone read the minutes from the last meeting? Yeah, it's fine. Yes, I move that we accept them as presented. Second. Okay. Um, in favor, everyone? Aye. Okay, in which case, adjourned.